And there you go. Okay, we're live. Um, cool. Hello, everyone. Um, so, uh, Otto is with us, and Otto is an independent scholar, which is uh, something that I very much approve of people doing. Um, having been to been from a university where people are uh, obnoxiously oppressive of any kind of imp independent thought. Um, and uh, I don't know, um, maybe you could just like tell us your, your academic history, the stuff you've been studying, where you've taught, that kind of thing. Um, uh, oh, okay. Hmm. Everything all right? Yeah, I was having trouble. I didn't hear what you said. Oh, no, uh, I was saying that, um, no, if you could just give everyone an outline of um, your your academic background and, and uh, the things that you've been studying and um, places that you've taught. Okay, uh, I did my uh, PhD at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and I wrote my PhD dissertation on comparison of the long-term effects of uh, internal exile of ethnic Germans, Crimean Tatars, and Meskhetian Turks. And uh, I had a, a few publications before that, uh, including a book in 1999, uh, Ethnic Cleansing in the USSR, and uh, one before that in 1937, uh, no, one in 1997, uh, The Stalinist Penal System. And then uh, after I did my PhD, I was unemployed for three years. And then I uh, got a job working at the American University of Central Asia in Kyrgyzstan. I was there for three years. Uh, and then they uh, fired all the foreigners after the 2010 revolution. And then I uh, found a job at the University of Ghana. Uh, and... Uh, I was there for five and a half years. Uh, but the problem with that job was that uh, uh, the pay was very low. So I started mm. looking for another position. And I finally got one uh, at American University, Iraq Sulaimania in Iraqi Kurdistan, where I worked from 2016 to 2019. Uh, and then basically the idiot CIA appointee of the university bankrupted it. And rather than cut his own salary, decided to fire uh, as much of the faculty as he could without uh, I mean, destroying the institution. It's currently in, in courts uh, for the last two and a half years. Mm. Not, not, uh, last year and a half, but uh, currently we're winning. So. The fact that I paid seven hundred dollars to a lawyer and I'm winning against the CIA is a, a pretty good indication I, of their stupidity. Wow, I mean, because I, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with that assessment because I can't imagine that the the courts in Iraqi Kurdistan are exactly watertight respecters of uh, common law and so on, are they? No. No. Um, mm. Yeah. Well. Um, oh. Yeah, so my basically my dissertation was basically on Soviet uh, policies towards uh, deported peoples and the system they were put under uh, special settlement restrictions. Hmm. Yeah, because I mean, one of the things that like, well, it's a big it's a big deal in South Africa. South Africa really, we believe that we're exceptional and special, and that no one's ever suffered like we have or committed crimes like we have, and uh, it's. Uh, generally speaking, there's a lot of prevail uh, prevailing sort of uh, ignorance about uh, the broader world. And I'll count myself in that because I honestly, um, until I stumbled on your stuff, I actually wasn't aware that Russia had instituted a similar system of racial discrimination. Um, and it, it, the, 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 the parallels are quite, uh, quite striking, actually. Yeah, well, there was a guy named Skalnik. Have you heard of him, the Czech scholar? Uh, no, he was in Cape Town for a while. Wait, uh, how long ago would this have been? 
uh, at the end of the apartheid regime, so late eighties, no, no, no. early nineties. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have come across him. I mean, unless he was studying something that was in my tiny little, well, he had my earlier taught, little area. He had earlier taught at University of Leningrad, but he was uh, okay. one of the first people to write up the similarities. And the reason the similarities is there is there's a guy named Sergei Shirakagorov, who was okay. uh, trained by Lev Sternberg, who was the uh, founder of Soviet uh, Soviet ethnography. But mm. basically, all of the uh, ethnographers in apartheid South Africa cite this uh, Shirakagorov guy to work after he went into exile in Japanese-controlled Manchuria. Mm. Uh, but the Soviets continued to basically use him as a basis of their theory and policy, even though they didn't give him name recognition until after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But if you read Julian Bromley, the chief post Stalin Soviet ethnographer, it's pretty clear he's just copying uh, Shiraka Gorov's theories. Okay, so cheapest. Oh, so how did how did they? Uh... I mean, I understand that the policy is mainly, uh, it was mainly initiated to deal with uh, a growing, what would you, wait, I mean, like, I, I, what would you say is actually the rationale behind initiating this? Because uh, as you said, it started in 1937. Well, um, yeah, that's where you have the, the massive deportations. But, I mean, things go in phases. But you have hmm. in the Soviet Union uh, early on, the creation of different classifications of people mm -hmm. that they call national nosti, but it's based upon the idea that these groups are unchangeable, they're indelible, and that they're inherited biologically. Mm -hmm. uh, so you basically have a system of race without using the term race. And at the early part of the Soviets, it was used as a kind of a Massive affirmative action policy for non-Russians. That is, you, you benefited from your national note if you were a, a minority, uh, particularly if you were in the historical territory. You get your titular nationalities, they called them. Uh, but this was based upon the theory that Sternberg had that uh, cultures were essential. That no matter how acculturated or how separated from the original culture. Somebody who was Jewish ancestry was essentially always Jewish, and that was his own ethnicity. Uh, if somebody that was Russian was always Russian. Somebody who was German was always German. So there's no way to, to get away from this sort of biological admixture, uh, in which case Soviet law allowed you to pick the one of the two parents as your, your classification. Uh, but... Uh, Germans and Jews and Poles that were totally Russified culturally uh, were still classified uh, as their ancestral immigrant uh, nationality, no, long, no matter how long they had been in the, the Russian Empire and USSR. And so this allowed basically the creation of the idea of whole enemy nations, uh, that they were tied forever to the external homeland. Uh, they were suspect. So the, the first one that... Uh, uh, where you have massive removal and, I guess, uh, geographic uh, separation is the Koreans are cleared out of the Far East into Central Asia in 37 for fear that uh, they could be a cover for Japanese spies coming from occupied Korea. Oh, so, they were t so for, with the Koreans, it was more about um, Japanese spies sort of disappearing into the being indistinguishable physically from them? Yeah, they would, they would take yeah. ethnic Koreans in the Japanese Empire and use them uh, as spies within the Korean community in the Soviet Union. Mm, well, that's a, that's <laughs> well, yeah, you can't accuse the the Russians of subtlety, can you? Um, the so the, the you you mentioned in your article that there, there's several different rationales for for each of the for each of the different ethnic uh, for each of the programs that are directed to different ethnicities and that uh, i mean how how would you how do you char characterize these different uh, these different strategies you mean the the the, the kind of motive for why uh, each group mm. uh, was yeah. uprooted and uh, mm. exiled in this uh, central asia or or siberia and put under uh, uh, movement restrictions. Mm. 
yeah, I would say the the the, the diaspora groups, and they start going after these in the thirty seven and thirty eight with the uh, there's a German operation, a Polish operation, a Latvian operation where they uh, target for arrest and execution a uh, large uh, minorities uh, compared to uh, Russians or Ukrainians or Uzbeks. And then there's, uh, so these would be the Germans, the Poles, uh, the Latvians, the Finns, the uh, Koreans, groups that were tied to foreign states uh, in terms of their ancestry and culture. So especially those that were in conflict militarily with the Soviet Union. So the Germans and Finns are deported uh, shortly after the Axis invasion of the Soviet Union in June 19. Uh, 41. So the, the deportation of the Germans takes place starting in September, but it's ordered in late August. So there's just a few months of chaos, and then the, they sweep them out into northern Kazakhstan uh, and Siberia. And the other groups uh, were groups that were conquered uh, fairly late in the Russian Empire. Kalmyks, Chechens, uh, Crimean Tatars, and these groups had always had uh, uh, resistance both to the Tsarist and to the Soviets. Uh, but they are mostly Muslim. The Kalmyks are Buddhist. Mm. And they also they only came under a Russian rule starting in the late 18th and 19th centuries. And they uh, were small groups. So the largest of these uh, groups, the Chechens, was only about 400,000 people at the time. They were deported. Uh, in uh, February in 1944. Mm. But uh, one of the, another thing that you mentioned is you, the, the difficulties with the Russian records. So um, you, you've, you've got a lot of these numbers that you've had to sort of extrapolate based on uh, sort of records that have been either damaged or, 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 or uh, deleted cold. or so on. Sorry? Uh, the records are also cold. Cold? Yeah, starting, uh, well, even under Stalin, they, they would remove archival records and destroy them. So what exists in, huh. in the Soviet archives today is a small portion of what was ever put in there. Mm. So uh, uh, what, 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 do you, what do you do for estimating numbers? Um, well, we have so many documents with numbers, we can just look at them, mm -hmm. I mean, but because mm -hmm. they kept repeating it. But okay. there, there's, there's problems with them. So we kind of just basically... This one's the lowest, and this one's the highest. But they all seem to be around the, the same uh, era for the number actually deported. Where the numbers are problematic is mortality rates, and there we uh -huh. have have a serious lacuna. Uh, there, it's the uh, you know for the Germans, which were the largest group deported, over a million people. Jesus, the, the death rate. Uh, people uh, prematurely, the, the excess death from around 1941 mm. to 1948, uh, when uh, live births again outnumbered recorded deaths, uh, range from a low of 150,000 to a high of 300,000. So, you know, we have uh, lots of uh, holes. And, and the Soviet archives even talk about it because they mobilized the adult population for forced labor among the Germans, and the labor camps uh, only give uh, very impartial, uh, only give very uh, partial results uh, for the mortality rates uh, in, in the camps. So uh, we know that uh, the record, we add them up, what we have about uh, 30,000 deaths out of 300,000 Germans mobilized into the labor army. But uh, that's obviously incomplete because some of the camps report uh, basically below normal mortality. As if there was no war, if there were, if they weren't in a camp, if they were living in a first world country, uh, and then there's of course uh, the fact that they deliberately released lots of people who were going to die uh, before they died. So they die on the uh, shortly after being released. Uh, and this probably doubles mm. uh, the figure. So it goes from like 30,000 to 60,000. Uh, but for deportations and, and labor camps as a whole, right, the, this 
policy that and along with just not recording stuff and uh, uh, recording stuff wrong makes getting exact numbers difficult. Yeah, it makes me think uh, all of these uh, little sort of tricky maneuvers to drive numbers down where there's ugly things happening. Uh, uh, it makes me think of uh, what the Cubans do to get their, um, uh, what's it called, their child mortality rates down, where they um, they remove the birth records um, so that the uh, ch uh, the child, the children who die, the infants who die get sort of removed from the statistical record. Ah. Yeah, this is, there's all different ways you can uh, change the categories. So, uh, but it, it, in this case, uh, you know, a lot of stuff just wasn't recorded at all. And then there's, of course, uh, the fact that uh, the deliberate policy to let people uh, die outside of camp. So, in the case of uh, the, the labor army, which was the Germans mobilized uh, during the war for forced labor after they had been deported, uh, it's uh, you know the the numbers about uh, equal that are released as invalids and those that died. But we think that almost all of those released as invalids uh, died prematurely. Hmm, yeah, I can't imagine as an invalid getting very far in. Uh in rural Russia. Rural well, some Siberia. people, you know, didn't even make it home. They were walking, you know, and a couple hours away from the camp, they fell down and that was it. Yeah, no, this doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like a holiday, does it? Um, oh my goodness. But, uh, you, you know, you, you read a lot of the, if you, if you're raised like I was in, in, in a, in, in the new South Africa, you get a lot of sort of endless stories about the horrors of apartheid. And I, I mean, at this point in time, it, it, it just, it, it's getting to the point with me where I, I'm, it, it sort of irritates me when people talk about it because um, comparing it to, you know, other, other sort of political regimes that were going on in the 20th century. So Africa kind of seems quite tame. I mean, even compared to like other, um, other political systems in Africa. Um, the the one that occurs to me immediately would be Ethiopia and the Mengistu. Really, sort of ugly, brutal, um, insane um, system of government um, with some really, really atrocious and callous ways of of governing people. And um, I I was really struck. Um, one of the things that was that, that struck me as very interesting was like the, during the years of the, the the first years when uh, that military government was in charge was the there was that debate this public debate amongst public intellectuals where uh, everyone agreed that they were Marxist Leninists but the one side accused the other one of being a fascist and the other one accused the first side of being anarchists. And you sit here splitting hairs over just quite how much ruthless control you're going to have over the peasant classes. Well, yeah, I mean, the the, the reason why Monty Python uh, get in the uh, life of Brian and the, the Judean People's Front versus the People's Front of Judea uh, strikes because uh, Marxist-Leninist organizations were notorious for such uh, a splitism, as it were. Yeah, we're we're having one at the moment where the ANC is running against um, uh, a very small party called the Economic Freedom Fighters, uh, and the EFF. Uh, they say, well, you know, we adhere to the uh, the the Freedom Charter, and the EFF and the ANC is not really taking these values seriously, and we're going to push the values of Franz Fanon and Steve Biko and and take them seriously and the, the, the ANC is stuck in the past with their sort of OR tambos and so on. Well, I, I, I highly recommend, uh, Franz Fanon's, uh, uh, wretched of the earth to read. Uh, he was, uh, mm. involved in the Algerian revolution and then became the, uh, Algerian provisional government's, uh, ambassador to Ghana. So he has a, he had a status in Ghana as a result of being the, uh, FLN's uh, representative before the French were uh, removed. Yeah, no, I thought he, uh, look, I read uh, uh, Black Skin, White Mask, 
And so I thought he had some. I, I thought he had some interesting. Um, there is a is a chapter in Wretched of the Earth that is uh, uh, widely assigned uh, in various. Uh, I don't know, underdeveloped countries, but it's called the pitfalls of national consciousness. Oh, what he argues, God, yes. Oh, no. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he argues is that the, the same people that were collaborating with the colonial government for their own economic benefit, this Compador class, they're all going to come into power in the new independent states uh, mm. or neo-colonial states to use in uh, <laughs> uh wording. But you're basically just going to have, you know, the same people. They're just going to pull down the French flag and pull up some independent African states flag. Uh, but there still be the, the guys that are actually, you know, looting you personally are not going to change. Yeah, I mean, look, he's not wrong. I mean, but the, he's, but he's, uh, I, I think he doesn't, he doesn't really take it far enough because if you look at all this, all the South African states now, they're still running on these sort of like superficial uh shells of colonial government structures um yeah well he died in what 1962 63 so mm. it's hard for him to i mean most of the french colonies in africa got independence in 1961 so they hadn't been in power very long no that's true uh but i mean like uh, it's it's really sort of like it's 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 sort of darkly humorous in a way um if you've got a dark enough sense of humor um the way he writes about you know the 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 coming utopia that the the, the fln will usher in and i mean i've heard people uh, sort of make little theories that his his wife who um killed herself like um a couple of months after a really really big nasty purge that the fln did um that it's mainly due to due to sort of the horror of the inverted aspirations that uh that she sort of uh that she did that um the aspirations for 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 this happy sort of utopia and there's there's a real sort of weird dimension to this where he talks about and i think he's partially right he talks about the the idea that um like fighting together builds the nation you get this coherent sense of national identity and so on and so forth i think there's there's a little something to that um but he he takes it to a really weird extreme where he says that um that the violence against the settlers themselves like the actual killing the physical killing and destruction of settlers bodies is a psychologically liberating experience Yes, uh, the, the famous statement that uh, when the uh, native kills the colonial settler, he kills two men. He, he kills the, the settler and he kills the subjected, uh, oppressed person. So it's a way of liberating the, the yeah. native. But I mean, if you want to look at Algeria was extremely violent. So like the numbers, of course, are a problem. But we're talking hundreds of thousands uh, mm. of people killed in the Algerian Civil War in the 1950s uh and that's uh, much much greater than the number of violent deaths uh in south africa during the struggle against apartheid mm. yeah i mean also the vast majority of deaths in south africa during that time were people killed by the anc um just by an order of magnitude um the number of people the anc dispatched in order to achieve a monopoly of the liberation movement dwarfs that killed by the apartheid state um even since 1910 um and i, I it, it's it's extraordinary to me that people don't um don't take this into account i mean if you start doing it, like even the most generous accounting um the anc's evils actually outweigh that of the nationalist party but we're it's still it's still taboo now people come after you like really really aggressively if you say anything like that but um i mean because at the moment we've got this really conservative estimate of twenty thousand dead uh due to what they call the people's war um but this if is you the look, udf in the townships in the 80s 
Well, not quite. Um, it's the ANC itself. So they had they had they had their own brigades and so on. The UDF was more like a front organization that organized civil society to 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 give like a human face to the ANC, which was banned. And so they were used for like funneling money in. They were used for ideological training, getting popular support. And there was some overlap depending on where you're looking, which city, which township, um, where the UDF would engage in building, particularly in the 90s, you start seeing this, where the UDF start uh, bleeding over into, into the self-defense forces and things like that. But uh, mostly it was Mkunto Esis where... Um, you know, and other ANC sort of uh, forces that were doing most of the killing. Um, the UDF, I mean, uh, the UDF, I mean, I think uh, th there's a lot of debate about this and there's the, the, they stabbed the fellow who who ran the UDF in the back um, after apartheid because he was a colored fellow. Uh, there's a man called Alan Busak and he was a Calvinist preacher. And after apartheid ended, he... Um, here he had an affair with a white woman, divorced his wife, and married this white woman. And he started getting hard feelings about the black economic empowerment scheme. And so he he made the error of criticizing ANC policy in public. So they pulled out all of these embarrassing details about him and his financial history and his and his sexual history. Um and basically smeared him in public and, and, and publicly destroyed his reputation. Um was, and uh, yeah, that was the end of him, uh, his political career. So the ANC, the, 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 they went, their, their, their tactics dropped several degrees of, of severity after they got elected, but they remained the same, you know, nasty bastards. And they've gone back to their old ways, but you know, now, but in a more sort of slow motion and sclerotic sort of way. I mean, right now we're looking at um, a battle between two ANC factions because the president is busy trying to prosecute his rivals in the party for corruption, you know, the the, the Chinese model of control. Um, and um, and so Jacob Zuma and his his friend, his old friends in the party, Esma Khashoggi and so on, um, they're doing things like... A, a, you know, targeting uh, their allies, I should say, are targeting um, uh, trucks and burning them down in the ro uh, in the streets, and so it's it's very messy. Um, but I mean, the, the, the whole thing with France Fanon, because because in my country now, there's there's still a, there's still a position where the the general project of the ruling party, all of these things that go on, people can criticize them and say, well. And this is lots of corruption, and there's a crime, and there's a crime, and there's a transgression, and so on. And this individual's bad, and this individual's bad. But no one ever criticizes the political program or the ideology or the system that they've built. Um, I mean, our whole constitution is geared towards bringing social justice. You know, that's the that's the main aim of it. So, it, it, you, you, collective redistribution, collective punishment, and so on. So at university, you've got um, Franz Fanon's pushed down your throat and Steve Biko's pushed down your throat and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and I actually tried to look for someone in, in the literature who'd criticized uh, Steve Biko, I mean, not Steve Biko, uh, Franz Fanon, from a, and I really struggled. I only found one guy. Uh, he's an Indian Marxist called B.K. Ja, and he goes through, he, he had a look at um, Fanon and sort of pointed out um, he pointed out that the um, Franz Fanon's like own uh, psych uh, psychiatric notes, uh, where he was looking at uh, where he was looking at patients who'd committed violence against settlers or, in fact, anyone else. They really suffered from 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 the trauma of committing an act of violence, and yet Fanon stuck to this weird model of liberation through drastic violence despite it so he really should have known better um, and one wonders whether he saw his um, one wonders whether he saw his writing as just pure cynical propaganda uh, I don't know I mean Algeria becomes a model uh, not only in Africa but uh, in the Middle East for 
all kinds of uh, future uh, guerrilla struggles. So Fanon is kind of the, the public intellectual face of that. The, the first leader of Algeria, Ben Bella, was kind of a, by third world standards, very much uh, low key on the, the uh, cult of personality. So I guess in some ways, Fanon is the, the replacement, but of course, uh, he dies early on uh, in the regime. Uh, but so you, you basically have the one work uh, on Algeria he, that he did, uh, Wretched of the Earth, which is very well written. So uh, mm. it has that advantage uh, that it, it's, uh, he was able to produce a short and uh, easy to read uh, kind of uh, manifesto for uh, anti-colonial revolutions. So I think that's uh, where a lot of this comes from. It's it's it's, it's hard to find. Uh, I mean, a lot of these anti-colonialist people, like take Mamar Gaddafi, the last Pan-Africanist, their writings are so incoherent you can't make anything out of them. <laughs> you know, I read it. Uh, I, I read his little green book uh, some years ago, and him going on about like football and. This uh, and and sort of trying to appropriate the language of feminism to defend like traditional patriarchy and weird stuff like that. Uh, it's very strange. But I thought his his governance tactic, his governance model was was, was quite sound. Where you have like this extremely strong centralized state with control over the resources and everything, and then further out, everyone gets broken out into extremely localized units. So, so the, the argument one, is that yeah. actually he, that Libya under Gaddafi wasn't a state, that he deconstructed yeah. the state to create it as uh, basically a clan with mm. himself as the head of the clan. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, from a from a power balance perspective, it's really good because there's no there's no little faction or element of government that can really leverage power against you at the center. Um, so as long as they can, as long as they administer their affairs quietly in the corner, they've, they're, 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 they're doing okay. Um, it's a pity. It's a pity he went actually. I, I, um, because I mean, despite all of his sort of, uh, nasty elements, there really wasn't anything to replace him. No, I mean, that's why he deconstructed the state. Uh, mm. if you remove uncle Mo, then you get chaos. So. <laughs> For the most part, people were content with this kind of authoritarian welfare state run by uh, your crazy uncle, Uncle Muhammad, and uh, Momar, I guess, is the name. crazy uncle, Uncle Momar, rather than uh, what came after, which uh, is a lot worse. It's now revived the Trans Saharan slave trade, uh, which was. Uh, I think the longest running slave trade out of Africa, uh, much longer than the transatlantic. Mm, yeah, no, there, there, there's a whole can of worms for you. I mean, the the the, the constant um, unending flagellation for you know the the Atlantic uh, the Atlantic slave trade just goes on and on and on, and you just never hear the end of it. Um, and, right, and despite you know, I mean, this is—I th I think this is sort of something everyone harps on uh, on about at some point. But you know, um, there's plenty of slavery going on right now, but not a hell of a lot of attention paid to it. Uh, yeah. Well, when I was in Ghana, most of the historical attention was to what they call domestic or uh, mm. indigenous slavery, which was slavery within Africa. So the transatlantic oh, okay. slave trade was uh, not uh, as great a focus, uh, and in so much as it was, uh, was the African component. So because it's, uh, I, I guess, more relevant uh, the slave forts there. But obviously, uh, the slave forts are on the coast, uh, controlled by the Europeans. So to get to Elmina or to get to Cape Coast, right, the slaves have to be. Uh, transferred a uh, considerable ways uh, down south. So most of them were sold in Thalaga, which is way up north uh, near Kumasi, and then made their way down uh, the uh, to uh, be sold by the Europeans. So the Asante would sell them to the uh, various uh, Europeans, uh, particularly uh, the 
Portuguese, and then the Dutch, and then the, the uh, British, pretty much in, in that order, in Elmina. And then the Danes were heavily uh, involved in uh, eastward in Osu, uh, Christiansborg, which is now uh, part of Accra. Okay, I, did, uh, I didn't know about the Danish getting involved there. I'm sorry, yeah, the my, Danish my knowledge the, of that area is... The, the, where the Ghanaian government is now based is a, a slave castle built by the Danes called Christianborg uh, or uh, Osu in, in uh, the Ga language. Mm -hmm. And they had another fort a little further east called Keta. And this is where all the slaves in the Virgin Islands came from. Okay. Oh, well, that, uh, that says something. Um, uh, my my knowledge of, of 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 the slave trade in that part of the uh, part of the world is not the most extensive, but I have read I have read a few interesting things. I mean, the one for me that that stands out the most is Alada Equiano's um, autobiography, um, which I thought was quite interesting because it paints it paints a fairly sort of detailed picture of the. Um, of 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 the slave trade with uh, inland, and um, I think a lot of the um, a lot of the stuff that's uh, a lot of the uh, slave trade that went on as well from from Zanzibar is is, is uh, something that I um, I was surprised I wasn't surprised to hear about it because the Arabs have been uh, doing a lot of uh, doing a lot of slave raiding for for a very long time, but. Um, I was surprised how far they went into the country to get uh, went into the country to get slaves. Um, I mean, it's hundred it's hundreds of kilometers, and it, it, in my mind, it it seems almost like an unnecessary expenditure of, of, of energy. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, uh, the coast uh, are, are difficult because what happens is the. Uh, the people on the coast uh, form the symbiotic relationship uh, with the uh, European colonists. So, for instance, uh, the Elmina, they're allied with the Asante against the surrounding Fonti. But then, in order to get the upper hand, they ally with the Europeans, starting with the Portuguese. Uh, but you see, uh, this becomes a kind of very closely knit relationship. Uh, not only politically, but even uh, families. So a lot of the big trading families in uh, Accra during the slave trade were mulattoes. So they would have uh, white men uh, from Denmark or Norway or England, and they would marry a, a indigenous woman. And they basically, uh, they called mulatto foy, this uh, mulatto class of, uh, had one foot in the, uh, Trading in the interior of Africa and one foot trading on the coast uh, with the Europeans. Hmm. How how extensive was the settlement from from Scandinavia? Because you don't not hear very, very much, much about because the, the average white man at that time had a two year life expectancy in the Gold Coast. Uh, he'd either die of malaria or yellow fever, uh, and so this is why single men coming they would basically get huge payments uh, to their families in Europe. And they got a dispensation from the Pope to take African wives in addition to their European wives, so they could be bigamists. So they go there, and as I said, they they take a an indigenous wife, and this kind of start a mulatto family. And these mulatto families would be the the big, uh, as it were, link between the European uh, traders by sea who didn't want to go inland and get malaria and die, uh, and the Africans who didn't have a. Uh, a maritime capability, so dependent upon, uh, you know, trading with the Europeans on the coast. Hmm. Okay. So, but then, um, and then, of course, they'd promptly die and uh, leave leave the mothers to raise them. I suppose. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, those that died, right? But uh, often you would have uh, then the the, the daughter uh, of such a of a such a marriage would then marry another European. So you, okay. you but you, you get uh, these these trading families that have uh, European uh, ancestry uh, as well as African ancestry. It makes me think a bit of the caste system in um, uh, Haiti. Well, they're not that large. Uh, no, Haitians okay, so more. Yeah, yeah. So but, how, how much? But, are I mean, we talking friend, about? there's a very famous uh, Danish Jew uh, named Wolf. 
Uh, okay. we, we know because he he wrote uh, quite a bit, and he married a Ga woman and was married buried after he died uh, in a Ga house. They they bury the dead in, in the houses traditionally. So his uh, he's you know his family became very famous as this mixed race uh, mulatto uh, trade family. Uh, that was very influential in moving goods from the interior to to the coast and, and vice versa. So these are descendants of this uh, Danish Jew and a, a Ga woman. Hmm. Okay, well that that um, jeepers. That's I mean th th this sounds a lot more complicated than I than I'm generally exposed to for these things. I mean I'm used to. I, I'm I'm quite used to my own country's context, so um... your own country is much more complex. <laughs> there, 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 there are no, there are no, there's no, uh, there's no uh, concept of. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose Ghana could have gone the way South Africa did if it weren't for mo the mosquito. That you could have had a <laughs> Danish, a Danish kind of Afrikaner class develop. Yeah, uh, but the fact is that, uh, as I said, the vast majority of white people died in less than two years before uh, you get to the uh, 19th century when they start having uh, effective treatment of malaria. Yeah, shame, poor bastards. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I, I had a, um, I, 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 I grew up mostly in 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 the Western Cape and then a bit in in, in Johannesburg. And so I had no idea there were parts of my country where malaria was a big issue until I went all the way up to the East Coast. And when I came back and I had like a bit of a sniffle or something and I kind of a fairly bad flu. And um, I was taken to the doctor and he just like, says, you, you know, just like casually asked, you know, you've been on holiday recently. I said, yeah, I went up to the East Coast. All of a sudden, like his face changes he's like, oh, God, do you have malaria or something? <laughs> and uh, yeah. I had malaria four times. Well, how would you describe it? Uh, it's like flu. Uh, your body aches and you have a fever. Uh, and uh, you get these chills where your teeth don't stop chattering. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah. No, I've had a flu like that. I've had a few like that. Uh, but yeah. uh, you go and you get the, the medicine. It takes about three days. Uh, you take four pills every four hours. Oh, jeepers. Yeah, I know that doesn't sound like a good time, does it? Um, do, do you ever have any recurrent malaria? Um, no, no. The stuff they have now kills it all until you get it again. Oh, okay. That's good. Um, and, like, I know there's, like, two different varieties. You have you get, like, a, a one kind of malaria, and then you get something called cerebral malaria? Yeah, well, that's where it gets into your brain. Uh, so oh, so that's have... just like a symptom thing. It's not like two different diseases. Well, I don't know enough about it. I'm not a medical doctor. I just know. Right. Yeah. I, I remember I had to renew my contract, so I needed a physical. And this woman at the, the hospital with the worst bedside manner of any doctor in Africa says, do you know you have malaria? And I said, no, I did not know I had malaria. What are you going to do about it? Because I will give you some medicine. <laughs> Uh, some people are very, very um, literal in their expression, aren't they? <sighs> yeah, no. But uh, I, I, I've, I, my, my sister is a bit more adventurous. I mean, she went on a, um, she went on this big, uh, like one of those journeys that all of the, uh, like that Europeans like doing, where you know you drive from Cape to Cairo up in a four by four. And I mean, she didn't make it all the way. She caught, I, I can't remember where she decided to get on a plane and fly, fly back to Switzerland. But, um, uh, she, she was talking about they, they flipped the car and then they got like someone, one of them like had to have stitches and things like that. And she had to take the, the, she had to take the sewing equipment away from the doctor and do it herself because he was so bloody inept and he didn't sterilize anything. And uh, I, <laughs> okay, I never had uh, that problem. <laughs> yeah, but this is in Tanzania, so um, 
Yeah. So I, they have I, that great glorious uh, legacy of socialism under Julius Nyerere. Uh, oh yeah, but Nyerere, I can't believe people still look up to him now. The man was so obviously terrible. I mean, and and the 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 political style of the government there, you can you can see the remnants of it. That that extremely brutal, unforgiving gatekeeping of everything. Um. I, I uh, the the what I what I thought was really peculiar was that it turns out that some of their ideas for land management were actually borrowed from the colonialists, um, but they just the German. Of, no, actually from the English. Funnily enough. Oh, okay. Um, well, yeah. So, so it was a League of Nations mandate after the, the yes the, the Germans. So yeah, we sent some of our troops up there to get lost and flee bitten and. Shot. Yeah, there's an interesting. There were some. The Germans bought in uh, colonists, both from South Africa, Afrikaners, and Volga Germans from the Russian Empire to try and colonize uh, German East Africa. Uh, and uh, when they sent the when they uh, left after independence, uh, they all went to South Africa, and these uh, Volga Germans kind of just became Afrikanerized, uh, assimilated into the the, the Dutch speaking world, as it were. Mm, so now that that's that's a little strand of Afrikanerdom that I did not know about. It's, it's um, not huge, but uh, the smell of apples. He talks about because his family were uh, Afrikaners yeah. that were in uh, German East Africa and returned to, to South Africa. Okay. Yeah, I know, but uh, and you read it. We read about one of the things that sort of stands out, and I haven't. It's been years since I read anything on this, but um, one of the things that stood out when I read about Germans in Africa was their treatment of the natives was peculiarly cruel. Well, it depends which colony you're talking about, and 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 how you define this. Uh, well, well, Namibia, mm -hmm. there was, of course, uh, almost. Uh, wipe out of the uh, Hilero mm -hmm. and Nama peoples. And in Tanzania, there's a, they have a huge uprising that's quite brutally suppressed. But in Togo, uh, they basically just went once a year to try and beat cotton out of the natives. So physically, you know, once a year, there's this, this kind of horrible physical, you know, plunder with uh, physical violence. But compared to you know, the system set up by the British in India or the Russians in Central Asia, where cotton farmers were on the verge of starvation all the time due to uh, huge debt. The Togolese were like, well, we still own all our own land. We still grow our own food. It's just one day a year the, the Germans come and beat us. It's just one day a year. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, it, it's, it, it's a horror, but there's something just, is so absurd about the arrangement of it all. Um, the, the 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 English system's far too rational to become a joke. Um, right. With the English system, you ever stop working for the cotton and you starve to death. Whereas, you know, the Togolese, most of the time, they work for themselves, growing their own food, yams uh, in particular. And so they only hmm. did the minimum amount that they could get away with. Uh, but, I mean, the Germans could never systematize because the... Uh, the Calvinist, the Basel missionaries, said, you know, it's okay to beat the indigenous population, but usury is a sin, so there will be no usury. Yeah, usury. My goodness. But you make uh, but uh, you're making me think now and uh, with you talking about the 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 Togo natives trying to avoid meeting you know, quotas or trying to avoid making too much so it takes away from well, the... Well, of course. Of I mean, it was in their, their own yeah. economic interest to try and uh, mm. do as little as possible for the uh, the Germans. But you're making me think of James Scott, who uh, I'm sure you've read James Scott's books yes. on, um, on Zomia and so on. I mean, he, his, yes, he has his a whole... great chapter on Tanzanian uh, villagization, in fact. Mm. No, I mean, like that whole seeing like a state thing. Where you, you, right, um, there's a chapter on Tanzania in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, 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 I, what struck me was, what strikes me is the little moments where he talks about Zomia and he makes this general sort of observation about how um, people try to escape, um, try to escape like state domination and regulation. And um, I think, uh, I, I think, unfortunately for the Africans, you can't really outrun 
uh, the colonial forces the same way that um, you know the, the, the Himalayan peoples could outrun the Chinese Empire. Yeah, uh, it's true, but there are ways. Uh, there are many ways in which they adapted into it uh, and try and it, and improve their own uh, positions. So this is why people no longer talk about collaborators and resistance. Uh, fighters in the colonial context in, in, in Ghana. They, they talk about acts of resistance or acts of collaboration because generally people will do both in their lifetime. That's an interesting... That, okay, that's interesting. But, um, but I suppose it makes sense because you're trying to get by in a complex shifting system and you're always going to end up on one side or the other of some power imbalance, you know? Right, but uh, yeah. So I, I'm sorry. Something just occurs to me, and it's not connected to this thought. But um, I, I I watched one of your recent streams, and you compared. I don't know if it was you. I think it was, uh, or it was your guest. But you were comparing. Uh, you were comparing Jerry Rawlings to Donald Trump. Oh, I just threw that out. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought that's such a peculiar thing. I can't imagine. Jer he just seems like such a totally different character. He seems so much more sort of smooth and relaxed, whereas, you know, well, Trump's got now. that sort of he burning. He just recently died. Yeah, yeah. That was, um, how many weeks ago was that? Not too many. Oh, that? Uh, no, it's not too many. No, it was quite recent. Like two weeks um, ago or so, yes. Uh, the... Uh, the, the, but there was no third coming of Rawlings, uh, I suppose, no. is the the take take from there. So, no, I mean you can only. Uh, I think look, you, a man's only got so much puff in him, you know. But I mean, look, I I only know sort of superficial details about about him. Um, a lot of people in the chat are asking about have asked about Ghana, and I thought you know Jerry Rawlings is a good good insight into some of the the sort of well, post colonial he probably... maneuvers. Uh, either the first or the second best uh, leader Ghana has had since independence in 57. Uh, the other contender is Kwame Nkrumah, the, the first president uh, from 1957 to 66. And before that, uh, the prime minister, when they had kind of autonomy uh, before uh, independence was granted uh, in 57. So, the people between Nkrumah and Rawlings uh, are basically, you've got a bunch of military rulers and incompetent uh, elected uh, governments. But uh, by the time Rawlings comes about, it's economically uh, a disaster. And Rawlings uh, has one coup uh, in 79 and, and uh, the policies don't significantly change. And he comes back in 81. Uh, and he goes from being a left-wing populist to a right-wing populist, uh, but he does a lot to kind of lay the current infrastructure uh, of Ghana to, to make it uh, comparatively uh, com to many of his neighbors, places like Togo, which is a total basket case, uh, one of the more successful post-colonial uh, states in Africa. What do you think changed his mind? Um Oh, he needed the money. I mean, they needed the, the the World Bank and IMF were not going to to provide the financing, which uh, particularly the refinancing of the of the currency constantly uh, is necessary for the kind of uh, import uh, dominated economy that Ghana has. So, you know, Ghana mm. basically exports uh, cocoa. That's the number one export. And they also have gold, uh, but uh, most of that is uh, owned by Anglo Asante Gold, which is a South African company, yep. and yep. Uh, oil, which is mostly owned by European companies. So they export those things and then import most of everything else, uh, particularly from China, but they also import uh, a lot of food from the Netherlands and, and Thailand. Uh, so if they, they don't have uh, the refinancing for the currency, which is constantly losing value because they're importing so much, uh, then it collapses. So to get this kind of uh, 
international finance backing, Rawlings had to uh, make concessions on the, the uh, removing the left wing, a lot of the left wing uh, populist policies. And, and there's some still exist, uh, but they're, they're dismantling them. So when I was there, they removed the last fuel subsidies and the price of food, of course, went up immediately because uh, uh, you need to transport food. But I mean, the argument from people from the World Bank and IMF was only rich people have uh, cars, so it won't affect uh, the poor people. Uh, of course, it only affected poor people because they ended up paying more for food because mm. the, all the price, uh, all the price increases were were passed down to them. I mean, when I look at these things, there's always a calculation that you uh, that I try and make when when I look at them. I try and figure out whether whether the policy is cynical or stupid, and it's always difficult to figure it out because there's a lot of you know sort of callousness endemic to African leadership. Yeah, um, this is true. Uh, although I don't think it's unique to Africa. Uh, no, seem no, to no, be all of these, uh, for better of a la uh, lack of a better term, post-colonial states, uh, huge amounts of corruption, huge amounts of uh, basically rule by post-ideological parties who are just patronage networks. Right, the the party gets mm -hmm. elected to to benefit the people that are in the party, and not because it has any vision. So. In many ways, uh, Rawlings was the last Ghanaian leader to have any vision for for Ghana. Yeah, that's very depressing. I mean, I know I know Kwame, Kwame Nkrumah had a, had uh, had some big bold ideas, but he sort of got he had um, huge ideas. They in fact had the term uh, with it, uh, gargantuanism or something to describe it. <laughs> Is uh, many because they have the huge <laughs> dam, for instance, that uh, they're still yeah. dependent upon for electricity at Akansombo. Yeah, but I mean, like he—he he really got—he really got taken, you know, didn't he? I mean, Tiny Roland really hollowed that country out, and I—I'm I, surprised at uh, in in many ways that someone someone who who appeared to have such a great, um, such a great sort of strength of vision could be blindsided by such an obvious thing because if anyone's read their history about how colonialism starts it's not states coming and knocking on your door and just arbitrarily demanding shit it starts with the it's always the merchant class that moves in makes uh, and makes waves and makes uh, problems for you right it, it, the, the portuguese looking to buy gold and uh, finding that slaves are more valuable on the plantations in brazil yeah, uh, my my favorite uh, one is like uh, I I can't remember who wrote it, but there was a lovely little journal article on the earliest moments of um uh, of colonialism in Yoruba land, and it sort of describes this very nice little tidy narrative where you get um where you get like British traders coming and setting up shops sort of casually at the pleasure of the local monarchs and chiefs. And then they make a lot of money, and the local environment, uh, the local economy starts hopping, and the um, local the local native uh, tradesmen make a lot of money. Everyone sort of starts getting an improvement in their lifestyle, but then, of course, it becomes disruptive because their power rivals that of local traditional leaders. Traditional leaders try and chase out the um, the traders and the settlers, and then the British come to defend their economic interests and their citizens rights all right well i mean the, the one thing that really dawned upon me regarding colonialism is that it only works because there is a, a co-option of the local elites uh, particularly in these colonies of extraction rather than settlement where mm. you have basically uh, the rule is uh for the british in particular is uh you know it's it's uh farmed out to the local chiefs so the local chiefs are, are, are enforcing the british colonial rule because they personally benefit from it in terms of their power prestige and money uh even if uh, their population uh suffers from it so you see this uh because it throughout uh the entire colonial world that if there wasn't any indigenous collaboration the, the system couldn't have been started or maintained at all
No, it's impossible. It's like uh, with any, tot- uh, even even in like the nastiest totalitarian regimes, you actually have a portion of the population that really does um, support the state and what it's getting up to because it relies on it. Um, you know, whether it's Nazi Germany or Stalin's Russia or what have you, you know. But I mean, what you're mentioning with the sort of the, 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 the control of the native leaders makes me think of South Africa, where we still have about 30% of the population live under traditional leaders. And what Jacob Zuma did to consolidate his power is that he gave all kinds of uh, legal rights um, to the traditional leaders that they hadn't had before. And so instead of having these sort of circumscribed um, roles that the the Ramoni tied to ceremony and tradition and property ownership, he gave them stuff like power of summons, uh, the power to uh, to create legal precedent, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so now you have a bunch <laughs> of, of uh, king kingdoms within the republic. Oh, it's enormous. There's a fant- and the thing is, it looks very, very similar to the um, to the old map of the Bantustans, um, except with a much more fa- fragmented uh, patchwork. And then he, of course, added a whole bunch of new ones. And there was a moment where he's uh, where, where they they uh, they reduced the number of kings that they recognized because some of the kings were getting uppity, so it went down from thirteen monarchs to I think six or seven. And uh, so it was very, very politicized. And like right now, there's a lot of tension going on. There's a lot of violence in in Kuzan Natal. And there, some people are speculating that um, that Jacob Zuma is going to defect from the ANC to the IFP if things get really, really dangerous for him. And there, there's a, there is sort of a a, a bit of um, there is a, there's a bit for that he can play with in that regard because the um, Jacob Zuma being master of spies would generally be believed um, to to be the person who has the inside info on on everything. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the heir to the Zulu throne, and now the Zulu kingdom is really something. Every other monarch in South Africa is sort of neither here nor there in comparison. But the Zulu, the heir to the Zulu throne, was murdered in his house in Johannesburg a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so this didn't make news in South Africa for a re- reasons unknown. And if I was Jacob Zuma right now facing a public inquiry, I would be taking advantage of this to get close to the Zulu monarch and be pressing for independence uh, because that would severely disrupt whatever Ramaphosa is doing. But. Yeah, you know, this is me being a stoic about this. So, so it would be an independent Zulu kingdom in Natal. I, I, I would, I would support that maneuver. <laughs> and and would it be I'm, like a, a a more successful version of Swaziland or what? I imagine they would face a lot of sabotage from the ANC. The ANC would do absolutely horrendous things to them for a long time, but. Um, I get the I get the impression that the international uh, community is getting quite tired of the ANC, um, nicking all of its investment money. I mean, the uh, the UK suspended the the the, the trade deal that we had um, in 2013, and then in 2017, they after 2017 they stopped their foreign aid to South Africa because. Um, Zuma nicked the entirety of that foreign aid budget and plowed it into creating a colossal mansion in rural KwaZulu Natal. Well, the ANC seems to be, you know, a throwback. So, I mean, it seems like it's one of these uh, Marxist Leninist national liberation movements from the 1960s and 1970s that should have just, you know, transformed itself and uh, been forgotten. Uh, after taking power. Uh, and I think that's what the international community pretty much wanted. But of course, uh, as I said, in most post-colonial, you get these post-ideological parties that are basically uh, uh, just looting whatever resources they can get their hands on. So uh, yeah, they, they no, both, my... they, they're not successful in creating, uh, as it were, uh, uh, viable uh state so i mean 
you look at the MPLA in Angola or Free Limo in Mozambique, uh, these national liberation movements uh, were not uh, don't have a great track record. The only one I can think of that looks pretty good is uh, Schwapo in Namibia under Sam Nuyama. And that may just be because Angola and Mozambique and even South Africa now look so bad. Um. I'm not so sure. I mean, they're heading towards the whole uh, expropriation without compensation thing, and they decla- And when uh, when the white uh, white Namibians uh, they registered in record numbers to vote because they're getting serious about voting in local elections. Um, Gengob basically upped and said, um, "This is an act of war." Them registering to vote, like. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't think I don't think they're any different. And the same sort of Mugabe nomics stuff is starting to be talked about in high ranking circles. I think the reason that all of this has been preserved so long is that the universities were completely captured by white communists. So my university, University of Cape Town, is was was known as Little Moscow on the Hill. And so the preservation of these ideas by people who are just I mean, they're just despicable. Um uh the, the, they've basically pr- preserved the prestige of these stupid economic and racial ideas um, in, in the face of all evidence. Um, and they haven't just sort of like trundled on as like some dinosaur element of the, of, of, of the university. They've become like the unquestioned unanimous voice of education. Um, you know, in 2015, there was something of like a minor cultural revolution at, uh, um, in South Africa where all of the students rose up and demanded that the only thing that ever be taught would be communism and black supremacy, although they called it something else. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's, that's obviously why I came to the Netherlands. But, uh, you know, I wanted to get a degree from a university that wasn't uh, under constant threat of having its library burnt down. They're gonna burn down the library. Oh, they did that. They did that in a few universities. I think the University of Northwest wow. and the University of KZN, and um, yeah, there's a few places. They uh, the the it, in my cousin's university, uh, CPUT, they locked um, uh, security guards in a building and tried to burn them alive. Um, shit like that. Um, but of course, none of it covered in the media particularly much because, you know, it's a righteous struggle. You understand for the freedom of the black child. So I, I don't have patience for that kind of wanky rhetoric, honestly. But, uh, yeah, there was nothing like that, uh, in, uh, Ghana, the, the years I was there. Well, I think they've got so much distance from from the settlers now. I th- I think they've got sort of well, settler never arrangement settlers, syndrome yeah. here. It was always a, a colony of extraction, primarily. Uh, hmm. uh, actually, the pre-colonial era was most of the extraction, uh, the slave trade. But the, there, you just have the Europeans on the coast uh, in these enclaves but i mean even there the enclaves right the 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 tribal chiefs that are agreeing to let them have the land to uh, build the these forts on the coast so that they can uh benefit from the trade because they're the ones uh, exporting the slaves to the europeans so the asante hini the head of the asante kingdom in kumasi right they become hugely powerful because the europeans show up and start buying their slaves and giving them things like guns which they can use to take more slaves Hmm. But it's interesting that you remember this because I, the uh, sorry, not you, the the Ghanaians, <laughs> um, that they they have a cultural memory of these things because in South Africa there's is absolute blanket amnesia on on all of this stuff. We don't learn at all about the Mfengu and what they got uh, and and their their sort of their collaboration in the Toza Wars. It's sort of like <coughs> it's pushed to the side. Um, one of the things that uh, the, that's extremely under researched is um, slavery amongst Southern Bantu people, because I mean the Zulu sold slaves to the Portuguese at Delagoa Bay that they caught from during the Infekane Wars, and the Sutu and Tswana people kept and traded slaves. They called Botlanka. Uh, but all of this is sort of put uh, put by the wayside, and the only place that I first heard about some, uh, you know major coercive um and you know uh possessive human possession sort of to uh, uh, uh 
what you call it, norms or practices, was through studying linguistics, because it turns out that the prevailing theory about how cliques made their way into the Bantu languages was because, uh, particularly the Nguni languages, is because they had a weird little taboo where the women that they captured um, and uh, made into subservient wives were not allowed to pronounce the syllables in the names of their in-laws. And so they would like substitute these That's little weird noises. That's serious uh, subjugation. You can't even say the <laughs> name. <laughs> oh, and I found out the most incredible thing. I had an argument with someone on on, on Twitter in, in Kosa. And of course, my Kosa is really terrible. So I had to use like translate to help me. Um, and this person, like the, the usual insistence that, ah, this is white man's history. So blah, blah, blah. And um, they referred to the Khoisan as Twa. And I'd never, I'd never noticed that one before. And then I thought, hang on a second. I've, I know that word. That's the word that the uh, Rwandans and the Congolese and the pig, used to yeah, refer the to the pygmies. pygmies. And so that's their ancient word for barbarian. And so it, it struck me as a, as a very interesting, a very sort of interesting. So you think this is a word that has survived the migrations all the way down from the Great Lakes to, to the southern yeah. part of the continent? Okay. I mean, this, <laughs> how crazy is that? So, I mean, th th that, that sort of like dehumanizing sort of diminutive epithet has survived for ages and they don't, they don't even know where it comes from. Of course not, but I mean, it's, I, it's, I, I'm not, not that great with languages. I, my uh, uh, my ability to learn non-Indo-European languages is pretty bad. Oh no, no, no! They're a nightmare. I mean, I remember the first time I tried learning Setswana, and um, the number of noun classes and how they're used just like didn't make sense to me at all. Like th they've got so so how you refer to yourself is care but care also refers to the subject of the sentence and it it will uh, so it's it's very very complicated and then you also use it as like the word that like you so i know that so and so so you'll use i i'll know i know care so and so like so you also got like other prepositions that match some of the the noun classes like ho which refers to the environment like you know You'll also use it like we use the word to, as in to go, like I'm going to go there, you know, like, um, <laughs> you know, kakwa. and it's, it, it's really, really, really annoyingly difficult to figure out from an early stage. I assume after a certain point, the, the, the learning curve gets a bit easier, but initially it was, it's an absolute nightmare because there's like 12 of these things that you have to learn. And there's there's like you know humans and inanimate objects and plural and some of them are uh, work like a mass noun class and it's just a nightmare. Well, maybe this is why the uh, African languages department was so big. You needed needed uh, more people than history department. Mm. Yeah, no, we but we had we had a really impressive one at UCT where we had some uh, some of the guys that usually Germans Germans have like a thing for African languages like something like eighty five percent I think of all the people studying African languages are Germans. Uh, <laughs> the Germans have a thing for lots of things galactically. Uh, you also find they're heavily into Indian languages, uh, Sanskrit. Uh. Do you think that's uh, got something to do with the whole uh, sort of uh, Goethe uh, vibe, which where you know, it, linguistic yeah. studies part made, became part so prestigious? The, that's part of it. And you also uh, you'll find Germans they're kind of like everywhere that they can like uh, have like a finger on. So like Eastern Ghana was under German rule for thirty years, from eighteen eighty four to nineteen fourteen. Mm. But we get like an on non-ending stream of Germans. Like the Humboldt University is a, a big place that sends people to to Ghana and uh, this. Uh, I have other a bone places. to pick with the Humboldt uh, with the Humboldt because they gave a prize to the lady who destroyed, uh, who almost single-handedly has has. Um, I mean, she's come very close to destroying the linguistics department at UCT. Um. Uh, I mean, like the kind of thing of like, I wish we could dance our languages and um, 
like that kind of horrendous like postmodern childish wank where she just you 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 extract all the substance from uh, from the de- from the um degree in the department and she's saying stuff like studying languages and codifying languages like as they're dying oh this is just colonial exploitation and so you know like the, the kind of denigration of her colleagues that went on was extraordinary and she gave a uh, she gave a position to um to this fellow who's i think still working there who at the time was doing a master's in anthropology at uwc which is like not much of a university and what he was doing was i can't remember what he called it but uh he gave it some wanky term but basically what he was doing he's going around the country taking little snapshots of like random street signs and then telling him about telling talking about how it made him feel to see european languages around and it's like there's no substance to this whatsoever so she decides that this is the guy to take the position over the woman from cambridge with two phds in linguistics um it, I mean, just the, the sheer defacement of the department. She also collapsed it as a separate department and folded it into anthropology because she thinks, well, we don't really need linguistics, you know. We don't. I, need I, are you undergoing a uh, a badly implemented uh, uh, program of Africanization? It's worse. It's all being done by Europeans for the most part because UCT is still a, a predominantly white-run university, even you know, even now, because any any black academic of substance is buggering off to Europe or America or East Asia to earn the big bucks. They don't stay around for patriotic reasons. The only ones who stay for patriotic reasons are really aggressive, bitter racists. Um, so I got I got taught by people who I got taught by people whose ideology was just solely geared towards justifying genocide, it, just absolutely poisonous people, um, and like the remaining sort of decent, level-headed uh, old white academics are just sort of quietly plodding along keeping their eye on the prize not saying anything controversial and then you'll have a conversation behind closed doors and they'll tell you yes it is all fucked uh but they're very good at keeping their science departments healthy because they know that that's where their bread and butter is so their research their research stuff is very very good but the humanities is becoming like a really really uh, well when i was there i don't know what's changed since but in the past two three years but it became a really, really toxic environment um, to use a, a, a overused word these days, but it, it really was quite poisonous. Uh, well, I, I haven't, I haven't seen any uh, opening to apply to in in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Neither have I actually. But we also the the one thing that I do have people Af- in South Africa looking for me, uh, but they said they haven't found anything. Oh, really? Well, I mean, you know, it's good to have people on the inside. But uh, I I, I think you might find it a little bit sort of, uh, I don't know, maybe you've got a high high tolerance for this sort of stuff. I don't know. Um, But uh, I'm I'm way too emotional to keep my opinions to myself. So I get, um, I I would have gotten into trouble uh, staying there. Um, Yeah. Yeah. How was your stay in, 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 you said you were in what, Kazakhstan? Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyz, you were in Kyrgyzstan, okay. So uh, I, mean, I lived you, in you Kyrgyzstan mentioned... from 2007 to 2010, I taught at the American University of Central Asia. Yeah. So you, then, did you uh, see anything like what I'm describing there? Because you said you went through a revolution and they got rid of the foreigners. What, what was it like leading up to that point? Uh, it, the revolution came really suddenly uh, in 2010. Oh, okay. Because it was more um, political, it wasn't. Cultural yeah, it was basically any. removal of uh, the northern clan and replacement with the southern clan. So the Ash people uh, around Bakiev were removed and replaced with the social democrats who were more from the north around Bishkek. Uh, I guess the, they just had another revolution, and this people are from the east, uh, east coal region around uh, the uh, lake, but. Uh, yeah, I lived and worked there for three years, and I uh, went back every summer uh, when I was in Ghana because my, my wife and uh, daughter are there. 
so uh, uh, but I um, yeah, I've uh, worked for American University of Central Asia, which was a, a Soros front, and uh, they uh, they got rid of uh, everybody uh, in uh, 2010. And then I uh, came across the job in Ghana, which was the first time really Africa had come on my, my radar, that there was a, an advertisement. And that was a really good job, except because our pay was controlled by parliament, it was really low. Uh, so when I went to Kurdistan, I was only in Kurdistan for three years, but I earned as much as if I had worked for 18 more years in Ghana. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. What was the, um, what, what, what was the university like in Kurdistan? That's, that's quite, uh, I, I, I literally It was, know, as I said, the American University of Iraq, Sulaimania. It's basically a, a CIA front. Okay. Uh, so it, it's like, uh, the, 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 I was an actual, you know, real cook, like a real cook in a, a pizza joint that launders money for the mob. But the, the main purpose of that university was to get Baham Saleh, uh, elected president of Iraq, which they did, and to create uh, an island of, of uh, so-called uh, intellectuals among the Kurds that are pro-Iraqi. So if you see if somebody who's Kurdish that doesn't support independence in Iraq, that they want to remain part of uh, the Iraqi state, they almost went to that every, university. In almost every case, yeah, they went to that university. Uh, as the Kurdish nationalists uh, are the majority, the C, and then there's a little dot uh, funded and supported by the CIA to uh, uh, basically create uh, a, a, a dependent class to keep uh, Bashur, which is what uh, they call uh, Southern <laughs> Kurdistan, a part of Iraq under Baghdad to serve U.S. Uh, geostrategic and economic interests. Yeah, I noticed that. Uh, I noticed a while ago that the uh, the fellow who's in charge of that place uh, sort of overplayed his hand in declaring independence before he needed to, and got his oil fields nicked from him. Well, he didn't declare independence. That's kind of the problem. He he had a referendum. Which That's passed. what it was. Sorry, this I'm and, I'm just remembering headlines. Yeah, that I, was I was there reading. in 2017. That was the okay. shortest war in the Middle East. Uh, <laughs> so he, uh, they had the referendum, and then there was no plan to follow up. He didn't declare independence after the referendum. Yeah. But he was warned by the government of Baghdad that if they did that, that they would retake uh, Kirkuk, which had half of their oil from yeah. the Peshmerga. And this was done by the fact Soleimani, the Iranian general who was recently assassinated, yeah. he went and he cut a deal with Bafal Talabani, who was head of the main Peshmerga uh, forces in Kirkuk and is the son of the former leader of the Soleimani government, uh, Jalal Talabani, the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. And so basically the, the PUK... Uh, Peshmerga basically abandoned it, and only a few other Peshmerga that were independent were left to defend uh, against the hostile Ashabi, which were these Shiite militias created by the Iranians to fight against ISIS. And so basically, you know, Bafal uh, Talabani just sold out Kirkuk. Uh, and this, this type of dab in the back thing is basically how Kurdistan has been run. Uh, since the Ottoman Empire. The reason they're not independent is they spend all their time fighting each other rather than fighting the Turks or the Iranians or the Arabs. Yeah, no, that's unfortunate. I think I think the Kurds really do have a hard time. Um, they, nev they never seem to catch a break in that region, do they? Except if they, you know, the, their leadership is bad, uh, very bad, and... When you see these wars, so you look at the Saddam Hussein's war against uh, the Kurdish insurgents, right? There are more Kurds numerically fighting for Saddam Hussein than there were fighting for independence. If you look at Turkey, the PKK, the uh, Kurdish insurgents, there were more Kurds fighting in the Turkish village uh, units uh, than there were fighting for independence. So in every one of these cases, the the as it were, colonial power, I don't know what you call it, the, the, the central power, is able to actually get more Kurds to fight against Kurdish independence than the uh, independence forces are able to get. Yeah, that's the, that's got to be depressing. I mean, I know what it's like, how demoralizing it is, because if, you, if, you're, if you're a middle-class South African, right, a middle-class white South African, that is, 
you know, there's there's a huge amount of middle class white South Africans who consider it sort of a lot like you know shock horror taboo to 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 uh, to, to criticize the, the the sort of moral basis of the current dispensation. And so, if you start entertaining ideas like Cape Independence people sort of look at you as some kind of evil, um, you know, neo-colonial apartheid apologist type person, um, which I don't think is true in any way, but, it, you know, it doesn't really matter to them. Yeah. I, I, I wonder how much that kind of mentality prevails amongst, um, amongst those, uh, amongst those Kurdish minorities. Whether it's sort of whether they whether they join up for pragmatic reasons or whether they have an uh, an actual moral sort of position behind it, uh, I think it's pragmatic uh, for the most part. Uh, uh, the, it's there seem to be very little uh, among people with any actual power. Uh, support for actual real Kurdish independence. Uh, I mean, the one guy that did really support it was uh, the communist, uh, Ajalan in the PKK, fighting against uh, Turkey. But uh, the government of the KDP in Erbil and PUK and Sulaimania, they basically are just these clans that want to take all the oil money for themselves. Uh, so mm. they would rather have that than to have an actual independent Kurdistan. Okay. And so this, this Ozalan guy, um, he, he's in he, prison he's, in Istanbul right now. Yeah. 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 So he, he's the fellow who's into Murray Bookchin and, and, uh, yes. But okay. before that, he was kind of a, just a standard Marxist Leninist. Yeah. Murray Bookchin. I mean, what a weird, obscure fellow to get into. Um, I, I, I've I've heard some conv uh, some some conflicting stories about uh about you know the YPG and that that lot because um, because you get that usual sort of leftist utopian talk about how you know wonderful and perfect and and rainbow tastic everything uh, is. I then, yeah. I actually knew quite a few guys that when the Yapa Ga they worked as waiters and uh, as shisha people uh, in various cafes and you know mm -hmm. the, all that. Feminist, Marxist, communal stuff, anarchist stuff that doesn't filter down to the the actual uh, rank and file fighters. The uh, Yapa Ga guys I knew were all nationalist uh, and heavily patriarchal. Uh, they just didn't want to be ruled by Arabs. Well, good for them, I suppose. At least in the <laughs> I don't know, um, but uh, yeah, I mean the the. The, the process of uh, as they say in this part of the world conscientizing the 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 the, the troops um the, ooh your picture seems but, I to mean, have frozen you, uh, you you froze up for a bit there. there hello we 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 back we back synced up we've got the connection back you know yeah i think so Okay. Now I was kind of just drawing the 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 connection over here that you, you you're talking about like a how should I put it an uh, an ideological deficit. So the people at the top who are talking about all this kind of utopian socialist nonsense, um, it doesn't filter down. But I remember um, uh, a while ago you actually sent me a little a uh, little video, a little uh, sort of documentary on the um, on on the on the Ethiopians. They're talking yeah. about how they sent in a lot of these uh, these uh, student leaders to go and teach the ordinary people about this new system that they'll be constructing. Right. Yeah. So, so. And social. I mean, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's it, it's hard to it's hard to measure how successful that is. But um, I mean, um, do you do you get the impression that that was more effective than say what's going on now in Rojava? Is they calling it? Uh, well, I mean, it's certainly there's a lot more force in Ethiopia that they can bring from from the top. Uh, but I, I, I mean, uh, 
a lot of these traditional societies are very difficult to change. So if there's not like massive force, like in the Soviet Union or China, uh, people generally stick to the old uh, ways of doing things. I mean, uh, if I were to go out to a traditional Zulu village, uh, how much uh, different would it be uh, today than uh, before uh, 1994 in terms of the way people think? Oh no! I mean, when you go when you go into like the really deep countryside, people are just—it's a different universe. Uh, I mean, the, the the black people in the cities and black people in the deep countryside are just like not even like there's no—it's a yawning gap, really. Um, the whole the whole demeanor of the people, how they behave amongst themselves, just totally different, and the the. You go into rural parts of KZN, you're still seeing people living in uh, mud rondavels, and um, there's parts where they still do like uh, parts up on the coast where they still do uh, like what do you what do you call them? They call them fish crawls. They build this like tiny weeny little hut in the in the, in the estuary, and they do this like sort of slow helix shaped fence going out, and then the fish will swim against it and into the little hut and they make their, their they make their money that way and you can drop by there and you get like massive fish for like 10 rand which is bugger all um you know like it, it's it, it really is like going to a different world the it's a different universe I, I i think those those places haven't changed very much at all but i think also the nc didn't send a lot of people into those regions to cause trouble they focused on the black regions within white South Africa for the most part. Um, well, I mean, my understanding is that in the case of Ethiopia, which you brought up, that there's a huge mm. amount of violence from the top being used to try and transform the agrarian areas, that they were uprooting people and mm. corralling them into these collective farms and whatnot. And if you like, basically just have a propaganda campaign, uh, rural areas tend to they tend to resist uh, modernization, and they tend to resist uh, these ideas uh, uh, coming from the more urban areas. So, and and this uh, is probably more the case in Africa because of the lower levels of uh, effective centralized government. Yeah, no, I mean that, that that's quite uh, that's quite ridiculous. I mean, I remember I did my um. So before I ended up doing uh, drug prohibition policy, um, uh, I was going to do my master's degree on the survival of uh, unrecognized states, survival of de facto states. Um, so like generally the effect of uh, a recognition on states. And so you, you look at all of the different sort of uh, de facto states sitting around now, and there's like, there's a good few dozen of them. Is that many? And yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got a list of them sitting somewhere, uh, sitting somewhere on a. A lot of them don't last long. They tried to. Uh, yeah, they tend to die in, uh, in the in the Volta region in Ghana. They're uh, trying to uh, create yeah. uh, uh, Togo land again. Got, yeah, Cameroon's uh, Cameroon's got a couple that are that are sort of. Uh, uh, well, I don't know what their status is now. I haven't looked for a while, so. Well, I think they're still uh, split in Cameroon because uh, the English speaking part is. Uh, not very happy with the French speaking part. Yeah, and then like uh, you know, we we know Libya was two states for a while after Gaddafi, and um, Somalia right now is well, Somaliland one, is de facto separate from Somalia. Yeah, since ninety one, and then um, and then and then Puntland since ninety six. Um, and what's interesting is that they map to pre existing uh, the map to pre existing uh, states that were from before Somalian unification under colonialism. So, um, so of course, Somaliland is British Somaliland, and Puntland is the old Majorteen Sultanate. So you've got... The, it's funny how these, like, these old little patterns seem to preserve themselves. And then Bougainville in Papua uh, got, uh, got auto autonomous status recently and so on. But I mean, you look at a state like like the Central African Republic. Its internal structure is just like there's nothing. Like you know, the 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 state barely holds the the capital city most of the time, and it collapses to 
a new invading army every 10 years, almost like clockwork, 10 years, you know? Um, and I, 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 I look at that in comparison to something like Somaliland where they've got, they've got like, they've got an almost functioning civil service and they've got a relatively peaceful country. So peaceful that, you know, Somalian families in London ship their kids back to Berbera to make them, to get, keep them safe, you know? And uh, I mean, the, the nature of London is not communicated to the wider world very often. Um, I mean, some, uh, the, the, the well-off areas are safe. The not well-off areas are not safe. Um, but, I, uh, I finished my degree in London in 2004, so I haven't uh, seen what's happened the last 15 years. But my understanding is it's not the same. No, no, it, I, I imagine it's not. I mean, even when I visited there, it was it didn't seem like much of an English city. Um, I, I, I did. I, I went to high school. The lot. I did my A levels, shall I say, in uh, a town called Bedford in Bedfordshire, the easily the most boring part of the whole country. Oh, I was. Um, I was in the centre. So I, uh, I lived for a while, not too far from. Uh, Oh, what is it? Well, anyway, I, I, I attended university at a School of Oriental and African Studies, which is over by the, uh, the British uh, Museum. Yeah, 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 the SOAS. Uh, I, um, it's funny they had a they had a job. Uh, they were looking for a job to be filled recently, and I applied to them. And they said no, but uh, it was fun. Uh, it was fun to ask while it was up. Um, They're uh, cutting way down. Uh, yeah. you know, they want to make all the universities in Britain be for profit. And one of the things they've, they've, they've done is they've really just gutted the, what made SOAS, uh, unique. So the, the, the specialty language librarians, like Chinese and Japanese are gone. The, uh, a lot of the language teachers for Arabic and Persian and Turkish are gone. That's a pretty... I mean, because once you They're make these you can take foreign profits, languages elsewhere, but I mean, obviously, the the university was founded to provide training originally to uh, British uh, colonial administrators in the former Ottoman territories in the uh, Oriental languages, particularly uh, Arabic. Wow, no, that's fascinating. But I mean, look, once you break something like that, you you, you break a community. And it's like a network of, uh, like, the, the, the institution has its own little memory. And when you smash it on the head, you, yeah, you, I mean, you're going to lose there, some... There, there has, and this has been going on for years. Uh, what they would usually do is the uh, two professors would retire and they'd only hire one. And they'd do some sort of, uh, you know, where the less popular departments would be phased out. So they basically got rid of everybody. Everybody that had been teaching for Central Asia except for one person now is gone. They haven't replaced them. Everybody, the caucuses is gone. They haven't replaced them. Uh, so the one place that they've kind of just kept uh, the same in terms of personnel numbers has been uh, the history of India because it's just so large. But everything else seems to have been shrunken. Uh, mm. You know, as, as people retire, they just uh, only replace at most half of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's dismal. But I mean, I think I think I think we spent like a generation or two where the universities expanded far too much for their own good. Uh, maybe I mean, but SOAS was always kind of a niche. Uh, the only kind of like silver lining is that uh, uh, the union, which is quite left wing, but uh, sometimes serves good purposes, uh, uh, have radically you know kind of resist us. It's been kind of just a uh, a flailing, but at least you know the the people in power know that the uh, that it's not a very popular policy. Well, shame, but I mean the student unions in in the UK are atrocious. I mean, can you imagine? I still remember a few years ago, and they banned uh, they they in the in the words they use now they 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 deep platformed uh, Jermaine Greer, Jermaine Greer for not being feminist Australia. enough. Yeah, do you remember? I mean, you, you know yeah. her big. Yeah, the second generation feminist writer. Yeah, well, she was she was she was banned from talking on any campus in the UK. 
because she's a, a quote unquote turf. Yep, that's correct. I, I, I mean, look, I have, I, I have a fair amount of uh, of lingering respect for her, even though I'm quite opposed to feminism. I think that she's indubitably quite a bright person and has um, has a lot to say on many topics. She wrote a very interesting book, actually, that I stumbled on in a Dutch bookstore, um, where she reforested the area around this sort of like rural house that she bought with a large tract of land in, in rural Australia and she reforested it with indigenous trees and, and she talks about you know maintaining the land and all kinds of stuff like this, this is so I mean like w whatever anyone says about her she's no slouch and she's not um, she's not like a, she, her intelligence isn't a fraud she she really is quite a, a multi-dimensional person um with with more than uh, with more than like superficial sort of I I I find that a lot with a lot of uh, people now is that there are a lot of people who who come from these sort of like identity studies departments or whatever from from like the younger generations tend to be completely vapid. Yeah, well, I I, I don't. Uh... I don't think I've worked at any place that had an identity studies department. Oh, oh I take that back. They had a, a gender studies uh, department in, in Kurdistan, but other than I guess there was a woman's studies department in Ghana, but it was, it was at the edge of the university, like over, <laughs> over, over way far away. Cause the, the university of Ghana is huge. It's 40,000 students. So it's like a city within a city. 40,000, 40,000. I think we 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 had uh, we had like twenty five thousand at UCT, and it's all up on the hill there and fairly isolated. Um, you you uh, can like the, the get there. There's like cab service that runs inside of the University of Ghana, right? Because yeah, the, yeah, we we have our own bus service it, up and down the mountain. Forever. Yeah, yeah. No, you have to have. You have to have. Like, I think. Um, I, I. I think that. I, I'm. In, I, I. think this is quite an interesting idea because you get a lot of the. Uh, a lot of universities are kind of like, especially in 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 like London, they're like geographically spread out and they're all mixed into the city, but uh, the, there are not a lot of universities that really have their own like little environment. They like a hermetically sealed environment, like like UCT does. And I suppose, like your university in Ghana. Um, yeah, well, um, University of Ghana has uh, residential areas where they have, uh, you know, the faculty living, and then they have commercial areas, like where they're actually little businesses and whatnot, uh, bars and restaurants, uh, you know, on campus. And then there's like uh, the uh, university itself, the offices and uh, the classrooms. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like you, you never, you never really have to leave that, like that little bubble, do you? Well, until you lose your your uh, uh, <laughs> university housing uh, because uh, you're not senior enough, and you have to go live uh, on the way very northern edge of settlement in the Greater Accra region. Oh, Jesus, that that just sounds like a pain in the hole. Um. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was quite fortunate to get uh, to get accommodation quite close to campus, but um, yeah, oh no, that 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 just sounds like a that really does sound like a pain. We have uh, we have someone over here who's been who's been chirping a fair bit and wants to hear more about Ghana, although I'm not sure what to ask you about there. <laughs> um, the 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 I mean, like, how would you characterize the ethnic politics over there? What's the what, what would you say are the big ethnic um, politics of Ghana? Yeah. Uh, officially, uh, because it's called the non discrimination law passed by Nkrumah, you can't have ethnic politics, right? So to have a political party uh, formed along ethnic lines is illegal, technically. Mm. Uh, but in reality, the NDC, which was the ruling yeah. party when I was there, is everybody who's not a uh, a con, and then the NPP, which won the election in 2016, is the con speakers basically. So uh, the Asante and the Achim uh, and some other uh, groups uh, that are linguistically related. 
So basically the Ga and the Eve uh, and these other people that were historical enemies of the Asante have one political party <laughs> and the Asante have the other political party. <laughs> That's exactly like South Africa. You have all of the minorities join the Democratic Alliance and all of the sort of and then black people will 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 join the ANC or the EFF and so the ANC is for um black people who kind of feel they should be on top but don't feel too strongly about it and then the EFF is for black people who don't want anyone else to exist and <laughs> and they're kind of they're kind of the same party now actually um because the EFF was a breakaway and now they sort of now working as a double team, a double act um, on most policy issues. Um, but uh, it's it's interesting how that works out when you have... Uh, uh, is, the, is the ethnic balance similar? Is it like... Uh, well, the Asante are like uh, the largest group. So I think uh, they're like 40-something percent of the population. They're not a majority, but they're a plurality. Okay. And then the other groups are considerably smaller. I think the Eve are like 15% and the Ga 10%. Uh, there's a whole bunch of groups up in the north, uh, the Dogamba, uh, the Wa. So, yeah, basically you have the Asante, they're a little less than half, but certainly much you know, larger than any of the other groups are uh, individually. Hmm. Okay, so that's a that's a fairly recognizable pattern, um, but I mean, I I I think I think a lot of people are um, they 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 suspect that this is I think a lot of people suspect that this is just a um, an African thing, where you where you get these ethnic divisions. But I think I think as 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 uh, as your work in Russia sort of shows us the the these ethnic conflicts are fairly universal and it's only due to the extraordinarily brutality and ethnic cleansing of uh, of modern europe in uh, in the early 20th century well i mean the soviets uh, had kind of like two prongs so i mean i focus on the prong of uh where they use the most violence but you notice that these groups are all fairly small the germans are the largest they get maybe two million people mm. Uh, and then the next largest group, the, the Chechens, they end up with maybe a million people by the time the Soviet Union collapses. So altogether, you know, they're uh, like 3% of the population when they're uh, ethnically cleansed during the Second World War. What happens with the larger groups uh, that are not part of the slight majority ethnic Russians is they get their own territories and their own fiefdoms. So you get the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic, the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic, where there is this creation of uh, a strange class system uh, under Soviet socialism that has a ruling uh, ethnic elite. So the ruling communist party in Tashkent uh, in the state is Uzbek. And then the, the technical trained kind of uh, professional middle that's mostly ethnic Russians, but has some other groups like Jews and whatnot. And then a huge mass of peasants uh, that are also indigenous Uzbeks. Right? So you have Uzbeks at the very top and then Uzbeks at the bottom and in the middle, uh, mostly Russians. And this is uh, pretty much, the, they call it the, the hole in the donut theory, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for all of Central Asia. So Kyrgyzstan had this too. But what has happened in post-independence is that most of the Russian population, with the exception of Kazakhstan, which still has a, a fairly large Russian minority, uh, have been driven out. They've, uh, quote-unquote, returned to Russia. Hmm. I, I came across this very weird... Um... It's a weird fellow. Obviously, I can't read him because all of his writing is in Russian. But I, I, I came across some people talking Russian, about Russian much it. easier to read than any of the uh, sub-Saharan yeah, African I to, languages. I have, to, I have to learn to speak it first. Um, this is only like <laughs> only came across this like a couple of weeks ago. So <laughs> anyway, so there's this fellow. Um, his name is he, he's supposed to be this really weird uh, sort of eccentric philosopher who's very popular in in Russia. No, no, not Dugan. Uh, Dmitry Galarko or something? Do, 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 I don't think I've got his name right. 
but he apparently he made a big deal about a class of people he called noviops which is um sort of the idea of like the new people of the soviet union that would be a mixture of uh different people and they'd be given uh, like special places in the bureaucracy um and uh, writing about how they sort of ended up as a dead end uh so uh, like a sort of cultural dead end after the soviet union fell apart uh well i mean there is this uh kind of idea of soviet man uh, which is there a, we go that's the word i was that was the phrase i was looking for soviet man yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, sovetsky chelovek and mm. what that basically is is basically a uh you know communist socialist man uh, so you have basically it's a hybrid of uh, importation of Marxist ideas and socialist ideas into Russia, and then uh, a lot of traditional Russian uh, culture, particularly as far as uh, official kind of state uh, political culture. And then what you have, uh, have you ever read Chinggis Aitmatov, the famous Kyrgyz could, writer? Could you, sorry, could you say that again? I just got like a brief Chinggis Aitmatov. No, I have. I have. Oh, wait. Well, he's uh, probably the greatest writer in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, which, uh, but he <laughs> he died while I, uh, in, I think he died in Germany while I was in Kyrgyzstan working. But uh, he wrote a book that's actually been translated to English called "The Day Last a Hundred Years," and there's this group of people in there called Mankurts, who are these zombies, uh, and. Uh, Literally in the book, because it's kind of a, a science fiction novel, is to uh, refer to these people that were Kyrgyz that had the, their brains baked in the sun by the Jungarian enemies during the wars against uh, the Mongol Jungars. Okay. But it's a, a metaphor for Central Asian people that have become Soviet people, that have lost their traditional <laughs> Central Asian culture. Oh shit! It's like the, so, so, so their own version of sort of black skin, white mask. Then, sort of, but more like you know these people, uh, bec they, 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 for, in order to get the benefits and privileges uh, and power of uh, the Soviet state, they basically sell out and, and forget about their own traditions and culture. So they're basically, you know, this, these Soviet Russians in Kyrgyz bodies or Kazakh bodies. Mm, my goodness <laughs> no i mean the, the, and, the, this... and because he had won the lenin award in 1963 he was allowed to write this very very anti-soviet novel and get it published in the soviet union in the 1980s that's extraordinary did did, did he did he wait for glasnost or did he just go no for this it? is pre-glasnost <laughs> My goodness! Now that's using your leverage. I mean, nothing, nothing bad happened to him because of it. He was still worshipped as a hero today. Uh, I've been to his hometown in Shekhar. There's a museum for him, but no, the, the Soviets uh, held him out. See, we we let Asian writers become, you know, powerful and and famous. And he, he was he traveled to Paris and uh, Berlin and all kinds of places in the world. He had book signings. He made a lot of movies uh, in the Kyrgyz Soviet Socialist Republic uh, about his novels. So uh, I, I worked for a while with his daughter, who's a, a political activist. She, she she writes a lot on Russian on Twitter. Uh, but I guess the, it, the protection doesn't fall uh, from him to her because her husband's been uh, incarcerated uh, for a while now. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's kind of how it is. I mean, you think about like at the moment uh, to use a really terrible sort of uh, comparison, but uh, I mean, the Mandela family still have a fair amount of clout in South Africa, but it doesn't give them big leverage. It doesn't give them the kind of leverage you'd expect um, from from that kind of political legacy. Um, they, they, they've 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 become much more marginal these days. Um, than than they were at the during, during the nineties and the two thousands. Oh, but uh, yeah, Genghis Aitmatov uh, and uh, the the idea of the mankurt. So this the is kind of uh, one way of looking at these uh, the top levels of these uh, socialist republics. Uh, that even though they're ethnically 
uh, all Uzbek uh, or Kazakh or Kyrgyz uh, argument made by people like Aitmatov was that uh, this was only uh, a physical uh, resemblance, that culturally uh, and mentality-wise they had become basically Soviet Russians. Mm -hmm. No, I can, I can see that. There's a, there's a lot of that accusation, interestingly enough, from uh, George Aiti. So he talks a lot about coconuts. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I tried to get him on, but I, I messed up the technical. So at first, he made a technical fo uh, fudge, and then I made a technical fudge. And Nobody in Generation X can use uh, YouTube properly. It's a, it's a genetic uh, thing. Yeah, don't worry. I um I for my own generation, I'm I'm particularly bad with this kind of stuff as well. So Oh, I'm I'm uh, actually one of the better Gen X guys and if you've seen the types of screw ups I've done. Yeah. No, the the worst part is my father is way better with tech stuff than I am and he's cuz I mean he's he's a he's a chemical engineer and before he was a chem engineer, he he did like a tiny but he he went to University of Witwatersrand and did electronic engineering, and so he learned programming like back in the eighties. And then Basic he dropped out. Global. Yeah, I don't ask me. Um, <laughs> I know he mentions Fortran uh, at some I point. That. But I don't know when he learned that. Um, and at any rate, he mentions that when he when he dropped out and then he went to the Merchant Navy, he programmed the first electronic navigation system onto the South African uh, Merchant Navy because um, they had all of these big mainframes that they purchased through some schmuchel that they didn't know how to use. So he just put some he just wrote some navigation software to save him some time, uh, so that he didn't have to do everything old fashioned. Um, and I was quite impressed with that, but he, I, I don't know. Uh, me and computers what, didn't uh, make it. EDA is what? He's probably almost a boomer now. Yeah, no, he was born in uh, 61. All right, so he's like uh, 10 years, well, uh, nine years older than me. Mm. Yeah, no, but uh, no, he, he, uh, he's, he's, he does very well for himself. A very, very, very competent, very organized man. Um, uh, me, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> I inherited more from my my grandfather, who's who who goes more, you know, totally different mold. Um, no regular jobs, uh, cricketer who picked fights with the umpires, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I I have no idea how I ended up getting into getting interested in academic stuff at all. But uh, it's it it certainly is much more exciting than punching numbers and uh, doing algorithms. There's a lot of numbers in academia too. I yes, the book manuscript and there's an amazingly large number of numbers in it. That's true. Um, I um I I deal with them when I have to, but I try and use what the whatever's the most simple possible model because even though I was very good with maths when I was in high school, I despise it. Um. And so, I mean, I I, I got a, I managed to do a thing um, for my for my masters, which got a reasonably good mark, um, where I basically did a comprehensive survey all of, of all of the national level indicators of drug use in America and Japan going back thirty years, and then drew a sort of like long history of their drug policy evolution and the made U.S. The drug policy has been less than successful. Oh well, like the U.S. drug policy is is a joke in every direction. It's 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 every mistake you can make in every which way made everywhere simultaneously. But the U.K. is one error consistently made in one direction for a very long time, and Japan is one consistent model of success. So, um, at least that's my perspective on the on the matter. What error did the British make? Well, what they did is. Uh, right after they actually decided they were going to have a drug prohibition policy, their elites uh, sort of got in and decided, no, actually, we're going to undermine this by um, reducing the, the the sentencing uh, for drugs. And so, ever since drugs then, drugs are illegal in Great Britain. They're illegal, but really? the enforcement uh, is very, very low. 
So when what I they was do in, is, I, I was pretty. I'm pretty sure that yeah. uh, for all intents and purposes, when I was in London, hashish was was not illegal. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm getting to. So they've gotten to the point where, like, they they haven't been enforcing their laws at all. I mean, they in 2013 they made it legal for you to traffic up to six kilograms of dacha. I mean, uh, cannabis into the country without right, punishment. You can set up your own little shop. In one one go. That's correct. <laughs> yeah, but if they feel like it and they don't like you, they can throw you in jail for like a year or more for 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 being caught smoking a joint. And so it's it's one of these really r like flexible things where most of the time the judges don't give a shit. You can be let off with a warning. No one does anything. But if they don't like you politically, then anything they find will just throw will just you know throw you behind bars. I mean, they did that with that uh, that fellow. What's his name? Um, that r the the right wing chap uh, who doesn't like Muslims very much. Um, uh, Tony Robbins. Tommy Robinson. There we go. Tommy Robinson. Uh, yeah, he Tommy he's Robinson. from nearby where I was in in the UK. Uh, he he's got his real name is something Yaxley Lennon, and okay. Stephen Yaxley Lennon. And so he um so he's from Luton. I was I was uh, I was living in Bedford. And they, the, they they couldn't arrest him for anything. So what they did is they went through all of his financial records and find something where he fudged, uh, some he fudged some form on his mortgage, and so they sent him to prison for mortgage fraud. You know, and it's like the kind of thing where like couldn't they try that shit with Abu Hamza? You know, I don't know. Well, that's that's the UK for you. It's 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 like that Terry Gilliam film Brazil. The, the laws don't matter unless they are there, unless they make it inconvenient for, unless they're there to be inconvenient. So. But uh, yeah, well, you know, it's so as the the pub was property of the it was property of the Queen, so the pub could not be visited by the police without a public warning twenty four hours in advance. So this basically meant that you could legally smoke hashish in the pub because, you, right? If they're going to come and, and stop it, they've got to let you know full twenty four hours in advance. Hell's bells! So I suspect a lot of people took advantage of that. Well, yeah, it was the school of oil and African studies. Lots of lots of people with connections to the homeland. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, it's better one golden brown than the other, I suppose. But um, jeepers. Um. No, but I mean, look, the, the the British really, really love their hash and their 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 cannabis. They really do. Um, I think I think they. I mean, they used to be the nation of of, of you know opium. Now they've got to find a different opiate to dull their senses with. But um, sure, but uh, well, actually, since it's been two hours, we're nattering on about right. this kind of stuff. Um, All right. I think we're going to we're going to uh, knock off unless you want to do like a couple of questions from from the from the chat. Uh, it's um, up to you. I'm oh, okay. Any questions in the chat. Well, we'll see if there've been any early on, and if there aren't any, I'm just gonna uh, I'm just gonna close. This is a very very casual channel. I don't usually do I don't do interviews on this channel generally. I just thought it would be nice to uh, put your views out there. Um, so going through the problem in Russia is where do we find another Putin? Um, that's certainly a big, that, that's, <laughs> that's you can always the question find of a the charismatic hour, strong man in Russia. They have no, no shortages of such uh, men in Russian history. Yeah. I mean, the, but, but, but the pattern that we see, the pattern that we see is always after these big charismatic strong men, you get sort of like a, a, a much lesser figure and a degeneration into yeah, mediocre Yeah, you get the leadership. chaos because, because people are tired of the authoritarianism. So they think, well, we can liberalize. We don't need to have that strong of hand. And then it becomes, well, yeah, we do because people are irresponsible and it goes to chaos like the time of trouble uh, or... Uh, during the period of time after the overthrow of the, the czar, when you had the provisional government, and so then things go back to this uh, iron hand again. But it's mm. not because there aren't people during the time of chaos uh, that aren't around that could be uh, strong rulers. It's just that uh, they haven't been given the go-ahead to 
by the populace to again uh, assert authoritarian rule. Yeah, so it's uh, so you you'd almost you'd almost be able to say that it's something like um, they need they need to have a a, a clear system of succession. Uh, yeah, well that that's been a problem. Uh, I mean, you <laughs> it's have a problem one, everywhere, isn't it? <laughs> right in Russia, you had the the breakdown of the rural rural kids and the the time of troubles, and then. The Romanovs were in power for not that long, actually, and then they're overthrown. And then you have uh, the Bolsheviks, the communists, are only in power about 75 years. And they have some problems, but they pretty much uh, get to the point of just putting the next old guy in power. So, you know, after uh, uh, Khrushchev, you know, Brezhnev, and then Andropov, and then Chernenko, so every, every year some guy will die and will replace the, <laughs> the head. And then Gorbachev comes to, to power finally and ends it. But uh, I... China was very good at that. They were very, very good at finding successes. I mean, it, the, you, you didn't see any of that degeneration into gerontocratic sort of nonsense at all. Uh, yeah, I don't know that much about, uh, about China, but... Um... They mm. seem to uh, have done better in the economically uh, for most yeah, well, of the uh, uh, post Mao era than the Soviet Union has done in the post Stalin era. I, I love I, what I really love is do, do, do like if you speak to if you speak to almost anyone now they talk about special economic zones and if you if you're talking about like uh, investment and governance policy like in 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 the modern world people talk about special economic zones but the very term was, of course, coined as an excuse for Deng Xiaoping to let go of communist control of regions that would have starved if he kept up Mao's plans. You know, places where he went by and he and he found out that people were farming crops they weren't supposed to in order to buy the crops they were supposed to farm from someone else in order to meet the quota. You know, that kind of usual Soviet sort of... Uh, uh, monkey uh, business yeah monkey business yeah. and so um uh, he looked at it and he says okay look we, this is just this is no good we're just gonna let them do what they want and um and he called it a special economic zone so when people in the west people in the west for some reason have adopted this language to describe areas with lower taxes or areas where you're allowed to start normal businesses and so on and it it's almost like they've 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 come to use the language of Chinese communists um, to describe their economic policies, and it's very very strange, very very strange world. And the, the the thing is, these people don't even you know understand what they're doing at all. Well, I mean that's uh, the argument Decoder makes in his book on the Cultural Revolution is that uh, the Cultural yeah. Revolution really had a bottom-up recapitalization of the countryside because the communists... Yeah, that's who I got it from. Control. That's how I got it from. <laughs> I got it yeah. from Dakota, yeah. But he's great. I'm surprised. He was I, my I, uh, yeah? methods teacher at SOAS. Oh, really? Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, no, but he... he um, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised that, the, the, that he keeps getting let into China to do all of this archival research because, uh, I mean, it's... China and he's saying some very unflattering things about their system. You know, uh, this is true. Um, the way he explains it, the Chinese Communist Party is far more concerned what Chinese are saying in Chinese rather than what some Dutch guy is saying in English. Mm. Okay, so they'd be very worried if his books got translated into Chinese. They wouldn't allow it. He says his colleagues in China, their books are no longer being published. Oh, okay. Oh, j just from working with him? No, but the type of stuff, working on the same type of stuff. They're not allowed to publish in China, in Chinese. Yeah, no, I can imagine. So I suppose it's a good thing he's doing it. Um... Holy moly! Um, <laughs> ah, so someone, someone over here has a, has a question about uh, Ethiopia in the modern times because right now we're looking at you know, pr you know, President Abiy 
um, having a big blowout with the Tigre People's Liberation Front or whatever that bloody acronym is that they, they, they're using right now. Uh, and they said, uh, and then he's saying a good example of how, and I, I think this is incorrect, uh, obviously, but he makes a thing. It's another good example of how the political homeostatic balance is to revert to the nation state with a single ethnic group, which, of course, is doesn't really reflect uh, what's going on with Ethiopia. But I thought it was, um, it's a good point to jump off from. Do you th uh, is Ethiopia doomed to be? run by dominant ethnic groups like the Am Amharic or the Omoro for, you know, for the rest of time? Or do you think they can work something uh, else? Probably, because the alternative would be it splitting apart. And we see on kind of a, a small scale that in Sudan that that's not really uh, good for anybody, it appears. So, I mean, Ethiopia is kind of an empire in a sense that you long time had the Amhara ruling all over all these other people, Tigrians and Oromo and Somalis and Eritreans, uh, etc. And this was kept uh, after Haile Selassie was overthrown and the communists came to power with the exception of the post-communist of Eritrea. It's still the case. But I mean, does anybody think that breaking Ethiopia up into ethnic territories would, would be a, a, a improvement? <laughs> Oi vey. I mean, I, I don't, I, I have, if uh, the thing is, it, it obviously cannot be done peacefully. If, if they all agreed amongst themselves in some magic rainbow utopia, let's have our localized governments and, and go our separate ways. I suppose that would be okay, but that's not how things work out in reality, is it? Uh, I just think that, uh, just like Libya and Sudan, uh, uh it would bring more, it would be a worse solution. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, there's a, a lot of romantic things, you know, the Oromo can talk about how they want national liberation. Mm. But think about if you split a fractured Ethiopia along ethnic lines, just what type of chaos and, and uh, uh, violence that would uh, bring about. Oh, it's atrocious. Um, I, uh, I mean, I, th I think many people remember the war that they had with Ethiopia, uh, not Ethiopia, Somalia. Eritrea. Oh, Eritrea. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah at, uh, um, at the end of the 90s, it just, what was that famous, uh, famous quote? Um, Two bald men fighting over a comb. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that must be British. Yeah, I, I can't remember who the hell it was, but uh, it's a, it's a, beautiful quote because the the amount of land they were fighting over was absolutely infinitesimal and there was nothing in it and the they just lost thousands and thousands of lives over that i mean just an extraordinary number of people died over bugger all um but I mean, I, I think one of the interesting things, I don't know if you've uh, kind of noticed this, but there's a tendency for uh, countries to break apart along the lines of long, long extinct um, uh, sort of colonial or Im empire, um, imperial uh, possessions. And I mean, aside from uh, Somalia, which we just noticed, uh, which we mentioned, I, I thought there was something interesting about how Eritrea broke off from Ethiopia. And Eritrea was part of the old Ottoman territory in the region. And when right. Libya and broke... became a, a separate uh, Italian colony. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ethiopia yeah. itself was uh, retained independence under the monarchy. Yeah, it's it's almost like uh, you know, all of these uh, all of these old little countries seem to leave little watermarks on the map. And people just sort of keep the, the, they keep filling back in. I noticed when uh, when Muammar Gaddafi fell, the country split very very cleanly into um, into like the old the old uh, pre colonial uh, things of uh, Tripolitana and uh, Cyrenaica and Fez. Uh, not Fez, is it Fez? What was that? What was that? What's that bunch of uh, tribal lands in the, at the bottom called back in the day? Uh, I have, uh, in the Sahel, I don't know. Yeah, 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 but it, it it's quite remarkable. I mean, I don't know if you've 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 seen things like this too. Um, 
where, where you get sort of like these lingering forms. And I mean, of course, they're, they're, they're back to basic unification now in Libya, but it's for for a long time it was it was very much along those lines along those old um old imperial lines for like a good couple of years yeah i mean you know uh, and uh, but that i, I think uh, almost like darfur was a a separate uh state uh, uh before uh, uh it became a joined with the rest of Sudan by the British. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the lines of where the people fighting uh, uh, often have this kind of deep historical background. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, no, I suppose so. I mean, I think also probably it'll just be like geographical limits. Like there's the same limits that, apply, the, the, that limited those empires in the old days will limit power dynamics in the present. You know, geography, ethnicity, transport links. But yeah, I suppose that's I suppose that's why the the Cape persists in its efforts to be different from the rest of South Africa as much as anywhere else. Um, you know, but uh, it remains to be seen what the divisions in America will uh, will, will will turn out to be in the long run. Uh you think we're going to break apart? Oh no, I don't know. I don't know that at all. Uh, um, but uh, I, I think that I think that would be a mugs game to try and play that uh, play with that. I don't think. Uh, I think even even if it were in the cards, it would probably not happen for quite some time. Um, I, 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 I don't I don't see it happening. Yeah. You know, uh, no, no, not for uh, not for decades to come. Um, but. Uh, a lot of people keep talking about, you know, sort of civil war and stuff like that. I think there's, I think there's a, there's a feeling in the air where people want to. I mean, if you look at a, a map of the U.S., it's yeah. not divided along these type of lines like Eritrea from. Uh, no, it's not uh, the Amharic <laughs> regions of Ethiopia or Kurdistan from uh, yeah. Arab populated areas of Iraq and Syria. It's these uh, urban patches. In this sea uh, of rural, rural patterns, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, it's kind of like old Europe, where you had you know these cities that were uh, predominantly German and Jewish, and and other uh, ethnic uh, minorities surrounded by you know, Hungarians, Romanians, Poles, Ukrainians, and so you have like the little urban dots surrounded by a larger you know rural population. How does the urban dot separate from the rural population? It, it's, it's like it's totally surrounded. It's like a bunch of tiny Lesotho's. Yeah, it's really, really dramatic. And I, I remember someone was making the comparison. Who is making it? Um, I actually think it was a, a it was a fellow I follow called Academic Agent. Although I can't remember, um, I can't remember clearly if it was him or someone else. But they were drawing the comparison between uh, America. Now and of uh, the Weimar Republic, the, and, the academic uh, agent did a recent one on that. Yes, where he yeah, went yeah, to yeah. any source written after 1945. Yeah, except one, except the one in the beginning, just to sort of like set the tone and sort of like give everyone a comparison of the modern day. And what I thought was really interesting was th the one thing he kept bringing up was that urban rural divide, and how stark it's becoming. Right, because the uh, the urban areas of Weimar Germany were were all the uh, degeneracy and uh, uh, wacko policies were 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 supported. So, I I would love to see I'd love to see some uh some sort of tension between urban and rural South Africa that wasn't just on racial lines. It, it, you don't think there's uh, a tension, or at least. Uh, Strong differentiation between uh, black urban areas and, and traditional rural black areas. Well, the thing is that they still maintain economic ties, and there's still family ties, and there's still migrant labor. And That's so, true what in they, every case. yeah, but these are these are fairly strong, and so. Um, no they can survive without food from the countryside. <laughs> no, I mean social ties. 
I don't uh, mean economic ties. I mean okay. like people actually go back. They go back home um, oh, yeah. in the holidays. So um, or P or there'll be like extended family networks. The the part. I mean like I I was chatting the other day to to uh, to a fellow who who runs a, a another guy who runs a podcast in South Africa. And he's he's very urbanized in Johannesburg all the way through and through, but. His extended family are in deep trance sky, and and it's there's still a tie to that area, and they they still go back on the holidays, and uh, the, the, there's still people who the, the, they go there go for their initiate they're people who go for their initiation back to the back to the deep countryside and things like that. So I think that has to wait for another like maybe decade or so before we see that kind of tension <laughs> emerging at least. But I think. Um... You do see historically in Europe that the uh, the divide urban rural is very much uh, ethnic. Uh, oh so, yeah. So, as I said, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, all these cities, you know, uh, and also the Russian Empire to a lesser extent, but particularly the Austro-Hungarian Empire, these huge, you know, minorities of Germans and Jews and and other. Uh, groups surrounded by uh, a countryside of uh, Hungarians or, or Romanians or or Serbians or or other groups. So, uh, and, and basically, the way this was solved was uh, uh, the Second World War uh, removed uh, either through killing or expelling of those groups. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean. It, it... You, you've, you, if you're, if if you listen to that story and you're a minority in America, your your hair should probably be standing up a little bit. Um, uh, but I don't imagine that's going to happen soon. I mean, the 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 power balance between um, the Democrats and the Republicans is just, it's it's not comparable, is it? Well, I mean, but things break down very fast. So I mean, oh yeah, yeah okay, okay, no, I get you. Uh, I, th I think it was you who brought up how fast Rwanda went from uh, uh, looking uh, stable to uh, uh, something like uh, eighty percent of the Tutsi uh, being exterminated. Yeah, and it, it, it's one of those things where, look, if you're looking at the political structures at a high level, and you're a politician, you'd have known what was coming, absolutely. But if you're on the ground, you can't tell. And so I think the thing is that people who are political analysts will see the thing coming with like a couple of months warning. They'll they'll know that something's about to happen. But I think the ordinary person will only know if they're looking, you know. Um, and that that's what freaks me out because I listen to a lot of people in South Africa. Like right now, we've got amazingly, amazingly uh, volatile, uh, uh, you know, ethnic tensions. But you talk to the ordinary person, and I mean, even, even the ordinary black yeah, person, like, yeah. they, they don't, they don't Africa, feel any malice. They don't. They, Africa, they, I can see uh, ending up like uh, Central Europe, uh, where the the Afrikaners and English uh, are uh, like the uh, colonial population of Algeria told to pack their bags. Yeah, except the difference is we can't really get out of there, not in any big numbers. So. Um, it's it is going to be a big problem, and then you're going to end up with white South Africans becoming a size, sizable refugee population in Namibia and Botswana, if that happens. So I think I think you're going to get some really really weird things happening if if they do that. Um, I, I I suspect also that there's a significant uh, source of. Uh, you know, paramilitary support amongst the, the the minority populations. It's not just whites, because there's a there's a there's a bridge between white and coloured populations. Uh, there's a bridge between white and Indian populations, and I think that uh, particularly considering the size of the private security, who tend to be um, fairly overrepresentative of minorities, you're going to have a basis of people who are going to be capable of doing something. But it will be. Uh, I think if things go south, it'll be extremely messy. So um, goes south. How much further south can we go? Antarctica. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think you know people people having a 
fantasies about cape, uh, cape secession and in my mind i think it's a good idea if we can pull it off but i also don't think it's going to happen cleanly and i don't think that people are really ready to pay the price yet but uh it's going to be a steep one yeah i uh i suppose it it could be um uh, because uh it's not uh, a insignificant minority. Like I mean, the Soviets were dealing with, uh, you know, a total of three percent of their population, uh, and even then there was huge amount of resistance uh, among the Chechens and some other groups. Yeah, I mean, you know, between between white uh, whites and coloured South Africans, you got like twenty percent of the population, twenty five. White coloured and Indians, twenty to twenty five percent of the population. And then you got a lot. Right. Then yeah. So I mean, it's 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 kind of kind of hard for um. It'll be kind of hard for them to do this. Um, it'll be quite brutal. But I mean, you know, you've you've got your finger. You you've got uh, you you've got like a fairly sound outsider's perspective on this kind of thing. Um, even even amongst people who are who are fairly right wing uh, leaning, I you know. You know, you don't see much sort of uh, optimism for our situation at all, do you? Uh, no, I, I. You know, it looked really good uh, for a while uh, during the uh, uh, Mandela years before Mbeki, but it was evident even then, once Mbeki took power, that uh, things were going to uh, decay. Really? Because it's, I mean, it's interesting you say that now, because me, I mean, I was a kid then, but looking back on it, I can sort of see, okay, so he, he undermined these institutions and he made these choices here, but from outside, people were already noticing that it yeah, was going down. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 was, it was basically conceded by outsiders that the reason the transition from white minority rule to quote unquote majority rule was as smooth as it was was basically the personality charisma and support domestically and internationally that Mandela had and that once okay. he was no longer the primary figure uh, it was going to be a, a decay and that they were going to start moving uh, towards Zimbabwe but the question was how fast so the idea was well if we can make it as slow as possible then it would be uh, acceptable. Hmm. Well, so so you're saying that you're saying that the general perception was that decay and Zimbabweification was an inevitable uh, was an inevitable future, and people saw it even then. Uh, no, I don't think it was necessarily considered inevitable, but people thought it was inevitable once. Once it became apparent that Mandela had not institutionalized uh, a way to prevent it. So there was this brief period of time when Mandela had power. Uh, and after that, because he was not able to uh, basically uh, um, put in some sort of, you know, obstacles to, to, to make it uh, mala to slow down, at least, um, obviously nothing lasts forever. Uh, the things fall apart, as it were, in in African terms. Uh, yeah, that it was oh. the honest way. So it was pretty clear. Could Mbeki, whatever his uh, qualifications, was viewed as extremely mediocre compared to Mandela by outsiders. Do you know what? It's funny. I was like what seven years old or something. I was uh, I, I can't remember seven or eight or something. Would have been a uh, and 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 uh, Mbeki took over, and I remember being told about it, and my immediate reaction was sort of like uh, f vaguely indignant. And I sort of thought to myself, "Who's this Mbeki guy? Mandela's my president, you know." Um, and it, I I think in a funny way, I must have been picking up the vibes from from everyone else around because it seems very much that. I mean, like uh, looking back at the cartoons from those days, it was um, uh, 
the the political cartoons they do things like drawing and becky uh, as a little man trying to wear giant's shoes or standing on mandela's shoulders you know things like that of like quite a mediocre man trying to live up to an enormous legacy and uh yeah so in many yeah. ways it's the same problem that other african leaders like Nkrumah in ghana had you know you get this this first leader that's uh, touted as being you know the father of the country and and great and wonderful things and uh things just fall apart after that but it's funny because he his his economic policies were actually not all that bad i mean he made some bad moves while he was governing but he didn't suffocate the economy with socialism and we actually got some nice growth and we got some reduction of unemployment um you know so it wasn't it wasn't all it wasn't all bad but he really did that, wreck that the wasn't what people were looking at people were looking at the fact that uh, the first uh, as it were post apartheid government of mandela had not managed to institutionalize a way to to keep uh, to to solve the problems right so uh, th- it was just a political there was a transfer of political power but the the social problems underlying a uh, conflict had not gone away for instance black poverty did not disappear yeah that's true now you would have needed you would have needed massive sustained growth for for years in order to really address that and uh, there's and no that's chance what really... outsiders were looking at that, that, that the tolerance for people for for not solving the problem was going to going to be short that that something like the EFF was going to evolve uh, because there was no way that uh, the ANC could in fact solve those problems post Mandela yeah I know there's a fellow who wrote a book called when Mandela goes and he wrote it in what like 95 96 yeah there's imagine- a long series of evidently uh, when when some South African leader goes yeah, yep, yep. I found all of them, and I was, uh, I was like, oh, this is wonderful. There's a whole they bunch of these people. should all be published people. in a series. When the leader goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, no, it was really fascinating because he he actually just like he predicted the future with such a startling accuracy. Uh, the way that he sort of said that um, there would be a a, a breakaway from the uh, from the ANC, and like he even gave them red uniforms. Like that was even. That was even in the book, and uh, they were called the the uh, the, the like the, the the African Labour Party or something. I can't remember the the National Labour Party or something like that. Um, and he basically sort of painted something where like they were, um, like black Nazis, and, <laughs> and the, it's exactly what happened. It's. Oh, it's 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 well, it's a comic. It's so comic. Agree, because economically, the Nazis had a a workable peacetime economic yeah. policy. <laughs> uh, basically, it, military Keynesianism, which yeah, eliminated I mean, unemployment. I call it, yeah, but I'm going to disagree there. I don't think it was. I don't think it was workable in the long term. I mean, think if let let's say hypothetically, well, we don't know because the war broke out. Yeah, but hypothetically, let's say they win the war. Everyone else certainly be- was. Um, they had they had from 1933 to to 1939. The EFF is not going to have anything like that if they no, come no, to no. power. No, no, the second they grab power, everything's going to go to shit. I mean, it's it's not even going to be it's it's going to well, be uh, dead. It's going to be I, dead. The, the the economic policies between the the two political movements are, are different, even if they both kind of a, a mere image of racializing uh, scapegoat. Uh, populations. Yeah, no, I mean, like, it, it, it's bloody crazy. I think, um, but I mean, they're almost certainly going to be in power in twenty twenty four. And so, from my perspective, I'm I'm just hoping that, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, like, I've noticed that there are some people, for for whatever reason, uh, who have some clout who've been, you know, following me recently on social media and so on. Uh, and uh, I, part of me sort of hopes that I can draw draw their attention to things that are, you know, the severity of the problem. But, um, you know, I, I can't go for the sort of ground bait maneuvers because I'm not that guy. 
and even if I figured out a good formula for doing ground bait on 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 social media, if I showed up in South Africa after becoming a big shot, I wouldn't. My I, I would have short shrift. I mean, people who get politically involved, they're followed by security services. They're followed by um, informal intelligence networks. They, you know, and then you you know you 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 wake up dead from some kind of like you know anonymous violent crime that can disappear into the statistical background. So, yeah, it's it it's it's not it's not worth it to become. <laughs> like a hectic um, political activist. But I mean, I think the best one can hope for in this environment is sort of to try and, you know, introduce, um, you know, introduce people who have some, some clout to ideas that um, they, they might not, you know, be thinking too hard about, maybe convince them things are a bit more serious, but uh, yeah, one step at a time, I suppose. In the meanwhile, I think, uh, I think this has been quite an enjoyable conversation. Um, I, I, uh, yeah, I, th I think, uh, I think it'd be good. I think it's, uh, I think it's good for people to sort of try and get outside of their, the, the little bubble and realize that South Africa isn't all that unique. And there's aspects of our experience that have been seen elsewhere a fair few uh, times. But, uh, to be less optimistic, uh, a lot of those, uh, Similar uh, positions, uh, the, the minorities did not end up well. Uh, no, they don't. That's that's not uh, that's not how history goes. Hopefully, something like uh, like the, the the only the only silver lining to something like Rwanda is uh, that eventually the Tutsis win. Um, but we're at, at an incredible cost, at an absolutely yeah, they, cost. they lost uh, like two thirds their population. Yeah, it's absolutely atrocious. I, I I look at that and I think anyone who anyone who points to 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 Paul uh, Paul Kagame and says, "Oh, this man's a bad man. He's an evil man, or whatever." I I look at him and I see someone who did what he had to, and is doing what he has to. You know? uh, all things considered, Rwanda is doing pretty well. Uh, it is. But uh, the fact is, to get to that wellness, I mean, there's a, there's a, it, it's a gap. Uh, so I don't think anybody wants to subject uh, their people to uh, a genocide, especially one that's uh, so thorough and rapid in terms of, of the percentage. So what is it? They said yeah, two thirds of population murdered in less than a year. That's, that's, that's yeah. an incredibly yeah. high proportion. That was a million people in three months. Yes, it's, it's, a million uh, people in three months. It's very rapid. It's uh, it's the most effective slaughter of human beings, you know, without the use of nuclear weapons. I mean, it's, uh, there's there's nothing you can really compare it to. It's really extraordinary. No, it is the. Uh, in other cases of genocide, generally uh, you're talking a period of uh, two, three, four years uh, to get that type of, uh, of percentage. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's really, really dark. Um, well, I mean, there's the now. Now they come with the questions. Um, now that we're so late into the bloody stream, saying what, what the what what the hell's going on in Uganda? I'm sorry, that's just way too big a la uh, can of worms to open right now. But someone said that you should read the Vampire Economy. I don't think I've come across that book. Have you? I don't think I have either. You know, no. most of uh, of what I've, I've read on Africa was either old books that I found in the university library. Or there was a bookstore that sold like just had one publishing company for like nonfiction really, and that was Zed. Zed? Yeah. It's a British company. Uh, they they publish oh, they call okay. themselves like third world publishers, but uh, uh for yeah. some reason uh this bookstore uh had almost everything that the that particular publisher published and almost no other nonfiction. 
I think that's uh, that's definitely something to dip into. Well, considering everyone else has kept their questions to themselves for so long, I'm I'm going to just call that a wrap. And uh, all right, thanks a lot for having me on. No, cheers, man. It's been a pleasure. All right. All right. Uh, oh, and if anyone's still listening, uh, Otto's stuff is in the description. There's a link to his channel, I believe. And if there isn't, I'm going to stick it in. But there's definitely a link to his academic work um, right. and a link to your, um, what, what do you call it? Uh, uh, Patreon. Patreon. Yes. Patreon. Yes, I stuck uh, your Patreon in there. Oh, good. Uh, independent scholarship needs support. He's uh, saying the URL doesn't work. Oh, for God's sake. I'll fix it. I'll fix it later. All right. All right. Thanks um, a lot. Uh, I'll see you later. All right, man. All right. So uh, maybe uh, you can come on my show if we can get the, the time difference right this time. Last time. Uh, uh, oh, God. That was that was my fault. I, th I thought terrible. you had agreed to, 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 to 4 a.m. at your time. Hey. hey <laughs> I, I make no excuses for my conduct. It's I, okay. I, Don't I, worry I about it. It's atrocious. <laughs> uh, I'll see you later. <laughs> All right, All right, man. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Good night.